Dear colleagues, uh, friends, uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's uh, webinar on scientific uh, writing, uh, which will be around, around about uh, three hours. Uh, I am Olena Zimba, and I will be a moderator of today's uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, I am sure that this webinar would be of great interest uh, to for all uh, stakeholders of scientific communication, uh, authors, reviewers, and editors. Uh, and I am very happy uh, to introduce uh, our uh, today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Armen Gasparian, uh, who is one of the leading uh, British uh, journal um, editor, clinician, and expert uh, in bibliographic uh, databases. Uh, importantly, that he is non-anglophone author, uh, more than 100 uh, English indexed uh, articles, uh, and over the past, uh, and he is also um, uh, an editor of uh, several influential uh, medical uh, journals. Uh, and over the past uh, 10 years, uh, hundreds uh, of non-anglophone medical uh, journals have been upgraded and successfully indexed uh, by Scopus and Web of Science, uh, thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Armen's uh, contributions. Uh, Dr. Armen, thank you so much uh, for your regular uh, contributions to our series of webinars. Uh, and uh, your uh, first uh, presentation is uh, really important, especially for early career researchers, uh, because it's about uh, uh, study designs. Yes, yes. Uh, please, you can uh, share your screen with us. Stage is mine, yeah, I see. So I'll, uh, it will take a few seconds to share my screen. Yes. As usual. Yes, I can see your uh, screen. Okay. I'd like to apologize if there will be unstable internet connection. So just remind, let me know and I'll switch provider. So I, hopefully um, everything I, will be fine. I hope that everything will be fine. <laughs> yes, with yeah. internet connection because the weather is really fine. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. So Olena, uh, our moderator, so you introduced me and uh, it's now my turn to introduce you. You are one of the promising Eastern European journal editors, uh, contributor of several index journals, social media editor, um, again, uh, in some of the leading uh, rheumatology and general medical journals. I'm really grateful to you for all your reviewer and editorial contributions to journals where I um, hold editorial posts and uh, contribute as a consultant. Uh, actually, I uh, consult uh, numerous uh, medical, biomedical journals uh, struggling with uh, indexing with Scopus and the Web of Science, and uh, I am really proud of my achievements as, a, as an editor and consultant um, because I've helped and supported uh, more than probably several hundreds of journals uh, on their way, way to Scopus, Web of Science, and also specialist databases. A few of these journals, uh, that I support uh, are now indexed uh, on Medline and archived by PubMed Central. Uh, we all uh, should uh, care a lot about our academic contributions as authors, reviewers, and uh, editors. And of course, we should be well aware of uh, common study designs, particularly PhD fellows who are starting their academic career they uh, should understand uh, basic principles of common research designs. And for that, they need some tips. So my first presentation will be about um, common study designs and how to uh, start, how to uh, kick off research uh, and adhere to best research reporting standards, best ethical norms, 
So let's start. First of all, all PhD candidates starting their academic career, starting to work on their dissertations, they should know that uh, uh, they should generate uh, testable hypotheses. Without uh, testable hypotheses, without uh, working hypotheses for their original research papers, it's impossible to uh, write up dissertation. So uh, initially, they should think about hypothesis. So hypothesis is everything for dissertation, for uh, postdoctoral research career. And uh, there is also a structure acceptable uh, by numerous scientific journals, structure of scientific hypothesis. Usually hypotheses are standalone uh, research topics, research uh, papers. And these research papers should have certain sections. The most important section is background, whether uh, there is something missing in, in, uh, in our hub of evidence. If yes, if uh, there is any gap of knowledge, so we can fill that gap. And for that, we should find evidence, missing evidence or an opportunity to run our, uh, to present something, to propose an idea, a hypothesis that should be also new, innovative, something new. So first section of hypothesis article, standalone hypothesis article is background. Everything about available evidence base and niche for our hypothesis. So second important section, is about hypothesis itself. What is, uh, what is uh, all about? What that hypothesis is about? Let's say vitamin D. Is it helpful in COVID-19? It can be formulated as a hypothesis. Why it is a hypothesis because there is no any large cohort study, clinical trial, or any original research paper, cohort study, retrospective or prospective, suggesting that COVID, uh, vitamin D can be a curative agent, can be a therapy for COVID-19. This is why we propose hypothesis. So there is gap of knowledge, no any study. We propose our hypothesis, vitamin D for treatment uh, of COVID-19. So it is a hypothesis. So we should test our hypothesis. If it is viable, workable, or good hypothesis, hypothesis then it can be tested in a research study. So we should also third propose third section of our hypothesis article. How we are going to uh, test our hypothesis, what we need. So uh, the idea or hypothesis can be tested in a cohort study. Let's say empirically 100 patients were treated with uh, vitamin D and uh, there is exposure and outcome. So treatment of disease or little outcome. So exposure is vitamin D and outcome is either disease course or little outcome of COVID-19. So we can propose also clinical trial, longitudinal clinical trial. So we are trying a dose, specific dose of vitamin D and we follow our patients. Let's say we calculate it that uh, our sample size will be 20, and all these 20 patients are uh, adhering to vitamin D specific dose, let's say uh, 
eight, 800 international units and they are followed for two months, three months. This is also a good trial to test our hypothesis. So it depends uh, on our hypothesis. Our hypothesis can be tested in several ways and each of these designs, study designs has its own limitation. So, and final part of any hypothesis is uh, about implications. Whether there is any, there are any ethical implications of our hypothesis, whether vitamin D can be uh, threatening, a life-threatening agent. If yes, then our hypothesis is unethical. Or if we propose a study design and we compare, uh, we uh, randomize patients into, with COVID-19 into those treated with uh, vitamin D and those treated with placebo. If vitamin D is a good agent, we risk lives of all those who are treated with placebo. So it's also an ethical implication, unethical study design, and it can also raise ethical concerns, particularly uh, research uh, of in institutional review boards. So we can also think about clinical implications, whether patients are treated uh, on vitamin D are treated uh, within uh, short-term clinical implications are good, acceptable. So our hypothesis is advantageous. So it's good, helpful for clinical practice. practice. So you see that scientific hypothesis as a standalone research design, research study also has its own structure. So we usually compare hypothesis, uh, uh, scientific hypothesis with narrative reviews, traditional reviews and systematic reviews. You see difference. And we, we, will, we will discuss uh, these different types of studies in a minute. So be sure that your scientific hypothesis is also based on comprehensive literature searches. And, uh, but uh, the difference is scientific hypothesis needs just limited or handful references, whereas narrative review may, uh, may be based on 100, more than 100 references. Scientific, systematic review is based on thousands of references, which are carefully processed, uh, some of them excluded, and only limited number is used for qualitative and quantitative analysis. So here is one of the studies, review articles, narrative review, which uh, contain rational hypothesis. Author published article as a review. However, its main idea is about vitamin D for preventing COVID-19. And as you see, I often refer to this uh, alternative metric measure altmetrics.com uh, ring and you see that it is colored blue uh, and it suggests that this hypothesis is well received by uh, society, mainly scholars, and most of them tweeted on this hypothesis. So taking this opportunity, again, I encourage you to um, register with Twitter and actively tweet any professional tweet with professional comment, few words, professional uh, approach, uh, influences your own profile and also profile of this specific, of any individual article. Here you see also map of societal impact, geography, geography of implications of this hypothesis. You see that it's, it is mainly 
reflected on map in Americas, Northern uh, US and Canada, Mexico, uh, and also Western Europe, uh, Iran, Turkey, but unfortunately the rest of Eurasia is inactive. It's probably because of language barrier, because in Euro Eurasia, most non-anglophone authors are passive and uh, are not registered with Twitter, whereas Twitter is one of the best uh, academic channels for communication, and it is now used for research as well. So please uh, learn more about Twitter and try to use it for your research uh, activities post-publication promotion and for surveys. Nowadays, survey studies are also based on Twitter dissemination of our questionnaires and uh, help to attract uh, hundreds of respondents for survey studies. So now about systematic reviews. I hope that some of you will uh, understand methodology of systematic reviews, uh, which is quite different from uh, methodology of narrative reviews, and will register, uh, register systematic review protocol in a specific registry called Prospero. And within a few months, one year, we'll uh, draft systematic review article. So systematic reviews can be uh, conducted by medics. Medics are quite active in uh, drafting uh, systematic review articles and publishing. Uh, in Croatia, for example, systematic reviews are proposed uh, as uh, the main part of PhD dissertations. And there have been also suggestions to use systematic reviews uh, to publish systematic reviews and defend PhD uh, title, uh, PhD degree. So you see that, but uh, other specialists, non-medics are also active and they also uh, publish few uh, systematic reviews in line with research reporting standards, standard which is called PRISMA. Prisma standard. We need standards for each article type. So systematic reviews are uh, usually based on specific study designs. Author analyzes, let's say, clinical trials, retrieve thousands of articles from bibliographic databases, and choose only clinical trials specifically dealing with research topic. And these clinical trials or cohort studies or case series are processed in a systematic way, uh, way qualitatively or quantitatively. If quantitatively, it means that systematic review is accompanied by with uh, meta-analysis. So uh, systematic reviews are considered as evidence synthesis. Uh, studies based on previous evidences, evidence synthesis articles. Usually systematic reviews uh, are drafted by specialists in bibliographic databases. We call them information facilitators or librarians. So these specialists are experts in searches through bibliographic databases. But I hope that in your part of the world, your scholars will be self-satisfied, will be educated enough to perform bibliographic searches and uh, write their systematic reviews without support of information facilitators or, or librarians. Usually librarians uh, contribute to Mm, quite uh, in uh, um, large systematic reviews uh, or Cochrane library systematic reviews. 
other than Cochrane uh, systematic reviews, uh, usual uh, traditional systematic reviews can be drafted by uh, specialists themselves without referring to uh, librarians. What authors of systematic reviews should know? If they uh, wish to publish systematic review on clinical trials, on clinical cohorts, they need to register their systematic reviews with Prospero registry, prospective registration. Retrospective registration of a systematic review is not allowed. So prospective registration of protocol of systematic review, it's online. You simply should enter information about your systematic searches, inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, qualitative or quantitative uh, synthesis, which is uh, planned by you. And in systematic reviews, you should have hypothesis as well. Why you need systematic reviews? You analyze evidence, then provide answer to your main hypothesis or aim of your systematic review and open way for prospective research study, another research study. So usually PhD dissertations uh, have their first chapter as a systematic review and this systematic review justifies PhD dissertation, main research or original research for PhD candidate. Uh, clinical specialists, rheumatologists, cardiologists are well aware that uh, practice guidelines in their field are also usually based on systematic reviews because practice guidelines um, analyze all available evidence and systematic reviews along with randomized clinical trials are tip of evidence-based pyramid. You probably know about that. So, which is why uh, clinical guidelines or practice guidelines of uh, European Rheumatology Association, American Rheumatology Association and other professional societies are based on systematic reviews. So you see research reporting standard of systematic reviews called PRISMA, preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. So all those who are going to write systematic review with qualitative analysis should refer to this protocol, but they, for qualitative analysis, they should omit anything related to statistical analysis and calculation within the frames of meta-analysis. So for qualitative analysis, what they need? Of course, in research report, they should provide information about previous Prospero registration, eligibility criteria of inclusion of uh, studies. Let's say you are going to analyze vitamin D clinical trials and a main eligibility is vitamin D in elderly subjects. So you specify in this part of research reporting checklist that you focus on, you should focus on specific studies. So which information hubs you are going to analyze, uh, use? Usually for systematic reviews, we need access to PubMed platform, which is just search platform. It is based, it contains information from Medline and PubMed central uh, digital library. And your search tips, how you are going to search through these bibliographic databases. So you should know keywords. All medics know about their uh, specialist keywords, keyword thesaurus called MESH, medical subject headings. Uh, other specialists may rely on Excerpta Medica uh, tree, EM tree linked to Embase or Excerpta Medical, Excerpta Medica database or Scopus database. Economists, uh, agriculture specialists have their own. Let's say 
economists use uh, American Journal of Economics thesaurus. So any specialist uh, should know about professional keywords in their field of science. So economists from American Journal of Economics, agriculture specialists from National uh, Library of uh, Agriculture, uh, linguists from uh, international um, language association uh, thesaurus so these are just examples of keywords keywords are essential for targeted searches through bibliographic databases i'll explain these importance of these uh, keywords a bit later so pay also attention to for uh, to pico pico tool for systematic reviews we need these tool and we should structure our result section based on pico tool patient intervention comparator and outcome or picos we specify also study design clinical trials course studies pico tool please note that systematic reviews can be drafted by any specialists uh, by medics non-medics um, veterinary specialists psychiatrists psychologists if they deal with drugs medical technologies technologies uh, rarely humanitarian specialists uh, art specialists sociologists they rarely use systematic review so a prisma flowchart uh, linked to prisma checklist tells us how we should proceed so these steps are important Identif identification of literature, screening of retrieved literature, eligibility, so we should rule out all unnecessary uh, items, and inclusion, inclusion for qualitative and quantitative research. Here is example from Laryngoscope, one of the top uh, ENT journal, American journal. You see uh, an example of good systematic review. So at the start, at the start, authors identified retrieved sources, uh, more than 3000 sources from different libraries, databases, bibliographic databases. Additionally, they uh, compiled information about 24 items from other sources, probably uh, on table sources, specialists know which trials which cohorts are important so they have on table these studies and they included at the start of identification then uh, I'll, I'll show you here uh, final step inclusion inclusion for qualitative research 73 items were used for qualitative research or uh, narrative review like analysis and finally they selected only 29 items for quantitative uh, analysis so it's important the less articles uh, you use for quantitative analysis the more uh, precise is your quantitative analysis pay also attention to methodology of this systematic review first it was uh, um, reported in line with Prisma standard protocol was prospectively before uh, systematic review. It was registered with Prospero. Uh, they identified articles via Medline searches, Embase search, and other databases. And uh, they specified language. So English language is usually used. And they also tell about keywords used employed for their systematic searches so mesh keywords pay also attention to this part acknowledgement to information facilitator or librarian who helped to perform initial literature search via databases so librarian provided the authors 
main authors or main contributors with uh, specific sources and then uh, authors processed these articles and uh, wrote systematic review at the end they simply acknowledged efforts of librarian you know that the system you now know that uh, systematic reviews should be registered with prospero to avoid redundant systematic reviews to avoid redundancies at the stage of publication uh, why is that because numerous chinese academic centers generate systematic reviews via paper mills via computer programs and so most of these systematic reviews lack novelty they simply um, pollute evidence synthesis process and this is why it was decided to register all valuable systematic reviews particularly those with quantitative analysis in the field of medicine with prospero registry prospero registry is part of uh, york university uh, but it is a global prospective uh, registry of systematic reviews. You see an example of uh, COVID-19 systematic reviews. Number is more than 2,300 systematic reviews on COVID-19 have been registered so far. And these systematic reviews, uh, not all of them are completed. So you see one of these examples, COVID-19, the risk of COVID-19 urinary shedding compared to other samples of PCR test in the confirmed COVID-19 patients. So this is study based on laboratory tests, urinary tests. And they refer to PICO tool participants. They registered this PICO uh, tool. Uh, specifically to inform about their preferred studies, preferred patients or population, patients with uh, PCR tests. Intervention, it was a laboratory test. So they collected information about PCR, positive PCR test in urine samples. They compared different samples so urinary samples with stool samples and serum samples so comparators for laboratory systematic review and main outcomes for this specific systematic review is rate of positive pcr test in urine uh, stool and serum so whether urine samples are informative to uh, guide clinicians uh, within realms of treatment of COVID-19 patients. So PICO tool is valuable for systematic reviews and it helps to uh, perform, uh, to draft table. And in this table, uh, authors should analyze step-by-step -step all selected articles. You see that uh, we should also use this standard for writing systematic review. It's standard initially proposed for narrative or traditional reviews. The main idea is to help PhD candidates uh, write their systematic review or those who struggle with systematic reviews to perform narrative review, to write narrative review articles, again, based on certain search uh, strategy. For that, they need access to all essential databases for systematic searches, systematic and comprehensive. Those who are going to write professional guidelines or uh, guidelines, practice guidelines of societies, let's say veterinary society, physiology society, they may refer to write standard for writing practice guidelines. Uh, these guidelines are again based on literature searches. 
practice guidelines is uh, themselves are considered as study designs. So it's a study to help clinicians act in line with their standard and treat patients or uh, improve uh, diagnostic accuracy in veterinary science, in allied uh, disciplines. Again, you see that searches are based on Medline and based psych info for psychologists, psychiatrists, and neurologists, behavioral scientists, psych info database is important. So, and again, practice guidelines should be also based on uh, in eligibility criteria, evidence criteria. Are you uh, going to write practice guideline based on certain level of evidence, clinical trials or systematic reviews? So, or case series if your, let's say COVID-19 is currently largely based on uh, individual uh, case reports and case series because most uh, cohort studies and uh, clinical trials are uh, with inconclusive results or in the process are on, ongoing. So for uh, our regular participants, this slide is not uh, new. It's a um, traditional slide uh, informing all our authors to use to employ searches through Scopus and Web of Science without searching through these both, through both databases, we cannot write proper articles. We need both, remember, we need both databases, particularly Scopus, which is the largest database with more than 25,000 peer reviewed journals. And mm, I review journal applications for this database, and I also very um, accurate are accurate with uh, selection of ethical peer-reviewed evidence-based journals in any field in medicine public health immunology rheumatology and uh, general medicine so i am sure that some of you who cooperate with Elsevier journals will have access to scopus database others need to use scopus um, free options. There are also free options. And Web of Science, now part of Clarivate Analytics, uh, it uh, has uh, several databases. Web of Science is just platform. So use it and use both and you will see. Main principle of systematic and comprehensive searches is to use at least two reliable bibliographic databases. Medline, Sinahal, Medline is the top bibliographic database of evidence-based medicine, Scopus is largest multidisciplinary database, and Cochrane's database of systematic reviews is a database, a journal, a hub of more than 15,000 systematic reviews, Cochrane library, again, tip of evidence. When you search uh, items, pay attention to their citation and i would also add pay attention to social media attention because nowadays we should also pay attention whether social media comments positively or negatively whether that sentiment positive or negative sentiment of society um, help us to understand importance of articles if i as an editor i regularly check your references references of submissions and pay attention whether, whether you refer to uh, studies with uh, reasonable citation levels. Or I may also go to altmetrics.com and find out whether there are some concerns because social media helps us to find uh, conflicting or problematic items which are negatively commented on social media. Uh, for your searches, you need datelines, five, seven years. What you should also remember that we cannot refer to non-peer reviewed sources, to sources from predatory journals, sources from retract, uh, uh, retracted articles, ret uh, articles 
which are no longer valid, newspaper or magazine articles, which are not peer reviewed. We cannot rely on Congress abstracts. Instead, we may uh, retrieve full articles based on Congress abstracts and cite these are items. For our novice new participants, again, I uh, strongly encourage to refer to these standards. As journals relying on these standards of referencing and cite citing uh, improve their chances of indexability. So uh, avoid citing articles without digital object identifiers, poor visibility, uh, chapters, uh, references considered as textbooks of, or um, old didactic textbooks, which cannot be considered as evidence-based. These are outdated didactic sources. So try to uh, cite articles instead of journals, uh, instead of handbooks, instead of dissertations, avoid citing doctoral and candidate, candidate of science dissertations. Instead, cite indexed articles, articles indexed in Scopus Web of Science Medline and based on uh, your own dissertations, any dissertation. Uh, our clinical scientists or veterinary specialists or psychologists, psychiatrists usually deal with case studies. Uh, let's say Sigmund Freud, Freud in his uh, uh, practice, he was also, uh, he abundantly referred to uh, case studies. He wasn't author of any large cohort study or any clinical trial. He uh, published um, books um, which were based on his observation, observation of individual cases. So nowadays, all specialists start their career by publishing case studies, individual observation or individual single scientific fact. And this single scientific fact is uh, reported in a detailed way. When we have a number of uh, several, uh, a number of uh, similar cases, we can report case series. If we see unusual case, we may also publish case-based review. So any case or report or case-based review is based on CARE checklist or CARE research reporting standard. So I here draw your attention to description of physical manifestations in detail. Uh, diagnostic flow, how you reached your diagnosis, detailed uh, uh, several steps. But if you have mistakes, diagnostic mistakes, and you report these mistakes, you disqualify your, ca your case report. So your unique or rare case report should be based on professional description of case of your case report. No any diagnostic mistake. Or you cannot report uh, er erroneous drug treatment or offline use of drugs. So this is one of the main problems with case reports for clinicians. Uh, Non-clinical, non-medical specialists may also publish case studies. And in that case, they need again, accurately present what they observed, uh, pertinent information. There is no need to report everything. Sometimes I see, clinical uh, reports with detailed uh, laboratory tests, uh, detailed description of uh, laboratory test results, uh, X-ray presentation, X-ray uh, images, films, or CT uh, scans. All these uh, uh, results can be presented in a few words. Case-based reviews 
should be based on CARE research reporting standard and standard of uh, working with bibliographic databases. I presented that uh, standard uh, a few slides ago. So it's a combination of case report and narrative review. And again, you see that this author uh, presented Prisma checklist Prisma flowchart, adhere to Prisma flowchart, and uh, presented here 21 articles for qualitative analysis. So it's easy to present 21 studies uh, in, a, in one table based on PICO tool. Again, patient, uh, intervention, comparator, and uh, outcome. Now about cohort studies. Cohort studies are uh, a type of observational research study. Medics and social scientists, psychologists, behavioral scientists often use cohort studies, large cohort studies. Or if it is a rare disease, you can also have small uh, cohort with case series. You should specify period of time for recruiting of your subjects, when you started and when you finalized recruitment for your key cohort studies, study. Because if you prolong your cohort study, your results can be uh, subjected to bias or uh, poorly uh, verifiable lack of uh, uh, re reliability. So try to do your case study, uh, cohort study within short period of time. It's particularly important for laboratory studies. Let's say platelet research. We usually run uh, platelet cohort studies within three, four, four, six months. Because if we collect patients within longer period of time, uh, reproducibility of our study diminishes. So we should try to stick to certain time limits. Uh, we usually refer to hospital archives and nowadays hospital archives also play an important role. Uh, PhD candidates, PhD uh, dissertants, they usually work with archival archives uh, preserved in hospitals. And again, uh, this is called retrospective, retrospective study. You should be very careful when you select um, these key, uh, medical notes. First of all, you should carefully choose your subject and be sure that your subject can be evaluated within six months, one year. And you collect all medical notes available for one year. If you collect more uh, case medical notes, all the case, uh, medical notes, again, you prolong your time timeline and it can cause bias. It can uh, subject your study to bias because of poor reproducibility, because of lack of reliability of your laboratory tests or other tests. And for cohort studies, we usually need not just correlation analysis. I know that you often refer to uh, Pearson or uh, Sperman correlation analysis, Sperman rank correlation analysis. Again, you should be very careful because correlation, bivariate correlation analysis are useless for cohort studies. In cohort studies, we have exposure, let's say vitamin D and COVID-19, but we have also a number of confounding factors. Let's say smoking, let's say comorbidities, ob like obesity, etc. So in cohort studies, we have multiple uh, variables and we need either logistic or linear regression analysis to correct for multiple confounding factors. 
Bivariate correlation analysis are not useful for large cohort studies with a number of confounding factors. I know also you often uh, do, you often run uh, cross-sectional studies. So you choose cohort and in your cohort, you specifically look at uh, relatively homogeneous population of patients or animal subjects. So in this case, you exclude a number of factors. Yes, in this case, you can also find out cases compared with controls and in each group, you can run bivariate correlation analysis, but because these two groups are relatively homogeneous. So you can use correlation analysis only in this case. Cross-sectional studies. Uh, we usually have, we may also uh, run survey study with questionnaire and we can use it as, we can present it as a cross-sectional survey study. Uh, survey studies are common in the era of pandemic, uh, current era. So <clears throat> cross-sectional studies uh, are relatively advantageous compared to cohort studies because of limited time period. And there is no variability because of timeline. It's run within short period of time. We perform survey and within one week, two weeks, maximum one, uh, one month, we collect all responses and analyze within one, uh, these responses within one month. We can also provide snapshot analysis of bibliographic databases. These are also considered are as cross-sectional bibliographic bibliometric analysis. Again, in the era of pandemic, these type of studies are also becoming more and more frequent. We analyze differences among recruited subjects and we can, what we can do, let's say in surveys, we uh, compare percentages. We have the whole group and in that whole group, some of uh, subjects have, um, are exposed to vitamin D, others are not exposed to vitamin D, and we compare percentages. And for comparing percentages, we use chi-squared test. It's statistical test also commonly used in sur surveys. In cross-sectional studies, clinicians can also uh, estimate prevalence of a disease or risk factor, let's say smoking. It's relatively inexpensive, quick study. Uh, Cross-sectional studies are valid for short period. So if you analyzed or you performed a survey within one month, next month's situation can be quite different or next year. Uh, next decade. So it is necessary to, uh, to have several studies to understand situation at certain period of time. And it's, it's still novel, still, val still valid study. Whereas systematic reviews, if you process data, uh, you cannot do the same analysis next year uh, or next decade. You should choose another subject. There is just one exclusion, systematic review, so-called living systematic review. Systematic reviews uh, stretched over long period of time and you collect data within one year, two years, three years and analyze report data immediately upon uh, achieving statistical significance or other important results. Living systematic reviews, which is quite different in cross-sectional or in any observational studies, impossible to estimate causal uh, cause-effect relationships. So causal relationships in observational studies, particularly in cross-sectional studies are unknown. You simply uh, 
explain phenomenon, but without explaining causes or origins of the phenomenon. Surveys. Now, why we need surveys? Because it's easy to run questionnaires, particularly uh, online surveys. We may, uh, what we need, just tips to those who are going to perform surveys uh, based on my own experience and the literature data. So we need to properly formulate questions. Some questions are categorical, categorical. Others are ordinary, ordinal, based on Likert scale, five point scale. I'll show you in a bit. Uh, interval, let's say age of patients, how, how old are you? Ratio, how many um, patients uh, or um, specialists use certain drugs for treatment uh, disease, etc., etc. Um, in surveys, we should avoid questions that contain answers. So we should allow our respondents to guess, uh, to refer to their own clinical observations, their own experience and answer to our questions. But our questions should be straightforward, helpful to and easy to understand. Uh, and they should be understandable to if we survey professionals, easy understandable for professionals. Sample sizes depend on previous similar surveys. But if there is no similar survey, let's say in the era of COVID-19, we cannot calculate our sample size. We simply may uh, expand date of uh, collection of data, analyze data, let's say by chi-square test, and if we see statistical difference of percentages, we reach our main result, main outcome, we can stop our survey and report it. So it depends on a subject a matter of our survey. What is also important when we uh, report surveys, we should avoid reporting the same, if it, uh, the same data in graphs and tables. Uh, usually we see that uh, uh, novice authors report the same thing, thing in uh, text, they pre uh, present it uh, in a table and to increase uh, graphical representation of processed material, they recapul recapitulate the same data in a graph. Quite uh, understandable graph. So we should avoid this type of practice. Examples of Likert, Likert scale. Not important, somewhat, somewhat important, neutral, important, very important. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So scale, five scale. Uh, another uh, graph based on percentages percentages, uh, how many provide, let's say, fast customer service, easy, different categories. These are categorical, uh, quality services, quantitative services. So, and we collect answers and present these answers in percentages. And we can also compare 30 with uh, 14, etc., and can calculate using chi-squared test. An example of a recently published survey study, which was based on survey monkey for surveys or cross-sectional research studies. Uh, we need online medium, online platform to distribute our questionnaires and uh, then collect answers. Our respondents should register with uh, platform and submit responses online. Uh, we, we usually need or uh, employ social media for our survey studies, and hopefully some of you also will do that. Uh, in India, uh, this one is Indian example. In India, they use, use WhatsApp. Uh, the rest of the world uh, use Twitter for collecting survey responses and distributing responses. And in this case, we do not need 
a percentage of responses. So try to understand this principle. Here is again Likert scale used for surveys. Strongly disagree, strongly agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or agree. So again, five scale. And again, you see that different numbers, different percentages. And other types of questions require other uh, graphical representation. Likert scale is the simplest. And of course, our graphs in survey also depend on subject matter. What is our subject? Here you see old example of survey, which was done by regular post in Britain. They asked, they uh, distributed more than 400 uh, letters sent by regular post. And each letter uh, had questions and also envelope with a paper to be filled. And respondents, some of them uh, responded to this questionnaire, sent letters to specialists who analyzed. Uh, they initially sent more than 400 letters and received, let's say, 300, calculated response rate equal to 70%, 70 something, and paid attention to several questions. Number of questions depend on subject matter. Here they use several questions, five or more, and one of these questions is presented in a rank-based level. Uh, rank of drugs frequently used by specialists. Let's say methotrexate is used commonly, and you see it's blue part. Blue part is ranked, uh, presented as the main. So most use this drug. Others use other drugs and all the responses, percentage of responses differ. They also uh, asked other type of questions, whether respondents agree or disagree or neutral. So they used Likert scale. You can also use Likert scale, mostly Likert scale for uh, answers uh, easily understandable and based on previous experience of uh, respondents. So these are probably common types of studies and I hope that our uh, tips will be useful to those who are going to write, uh, run survey studies and write survey reports. Again, survey reports should be also based on research reporting guidelines. It's called CHERRY, CHERRY for surveys. And again, I hope that psychologists, um, psychiatrists, uh, specialists in uh, clinical medicine we frequently refer to their professional societies and ask their opinion. Over to you, our moderator. Um, dear Arman, thank you very much for your elegant and really informative and I'm sure very useful for our participants uh, presentation. Uh, we uh, encourage our participants uh, ask uh, questions. Uh, you can simply uh, type them into uh, chat uh, box uh, uh, on your Zoom uh, panel and I will bring up these questions and also we will have uh, time at the end of our webinar, approximately 20 minutes uh, for uh, your questions. Uh, now we have participants uh, not only from Ukraine but also from uh, Qatar. Sergei Suchelnitsky uh, joined us uh, from the US, uh, Vasily Lunchina, uh, from Bulgaria, Vladislava, and we have uh, participants uh, from uh, from five uh, cities uh, of Ukraine: uh, Lviv, Ternopil, Ivano-Frankivsk, uh, Vinnytsia, uh, and Kharkiv. <laughs> I hope that all of them uh, will try to implement, uh, enforce these tips in their practice, and will run surveys. Surveys are. Um, inexpensive research studies, uh, quickly done if, um, of course, 
specialists uh, for PhD dissertations. These surveys are also very useful and young specialists may analyze experience of their professional community, present second chapter of their dissertation as a survey. But of course they should know uh, their subject matter, should understand what type of questions they need. They may have five questions presented for uh, their survey, but uh, if subject is different, from five, uh, number of questions can range from five to hundred. It depends. Uh, yes, and we have one question from our participants from Vasil Lunchina. Uh, what uh, what do so we, <laughs> uh, what do we do as uh, a reviewer or editors uh, when a manuscript uh, includes uh, reference items? that you mentioned should not be considered, such as dissertation, uh, abstracts. Okay. Yeah, Professor uh, Vasil Lenchina is uh, an expert in ethical uh, science, uh, expert in bioethics, and he, his question also uh, relates to uh, ethical stance of reviewers and editors. Yes, if editors uh, or reviewer spot any unethical reference in reference list of manuscripts, uh, they may suggest replacement of or omission of this type of references. Sometimes when reviewers suggest uh, replacements or omissions of references, they suggest their own uh, articles. It's all, if it is irrelevant, if these re relevant uh, references are re irrelevant and multiple uh, examples, multiple references, references, this can be also considered as unethical stance of reviewers. So reviewers should uh, keep balance and they should carefully uh, formulate their reviewer comments, suggest a replacement of references or omission if they are sure that these references are unethical uh, unreliable or not based on evidence-based data. An another question? Yes, and another question from uh, Vasily Lunchina. Uh, what, uh, um, just a moment, uh, should a journal itemize uh, in the instructions uh, that in a systematic review, it must be pre-registered with uh, a Prospero, I think, uh, with Prospero, uh, so as not to encourage submission uh, of such studies uh, to the journal? It depends. There are some subject matters that are innovative and uh, editors are sure that no any specialist is working on the same subject. Only in that case, editor may accept without having Prospero registration. But of course, in instructions for authors, editors should mention that they uh, give preference to systematic reviews with uh, prospectively registered uh, protocols. Uh, is it free of charge, uh, this registration? Uh, yes, sure, oh. yeah. Prospero is a free registry for registration of systematic reviews. Yes. Excellent. Okay, and um, uh, 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 question from Sergei uh, Sochelnitsky. Uh, thanks from for nice presentation Qatar? from from Qatar. Yes. <laughs> uh, what you presented is important for cohort studies, uh, for analysis of personalization of treatment, and not just a single case study. Availability of original uh, primary data is essential. Uh, how about requirements of deposition of original data or links uh, to them? What are databases? Uh, such deposition is frequent for web, uh, for wet lab studies, especially omics, um, lack of personal, um, um, personal uh, cohort data may lead to uh, misleading conclusions. Uh, cancer and now COVID-19 are good uh, examples. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, question, good question. 
but um, we should uh, specify uh, the essence of this question. So it, in my opinion, it relates to data sharing policy of journals. Uh, most journals, partic particularly Schwinger Nature journals, ask authors to submit their primary data or original research studies, or even for systematic reviews, proto uh, processed data, primary data, along with manuscripts, and ask to deposit these data somewhere as a supplementary material or in a repository. Let's say research square one, square one research repository employed by Springer Nature. So for your local journal, data sharing policy is also useful and it will help avoid fabrication, uh, data manipulation or uh, publication of misleading research studies. So try to include that point in your instructions for authors if you are sure that you have hub for archiving uh, primary research data. And I know that all PhD candidates save their primary research data somewhere because for life, because they can be asked to present their uh, dissertation data for uh, data analysis, for statistical analysis. So data sharing policy is important. Uh, from Sergei Sechelnitsky, uh, thanks, answered. Thank you. And one uh, last question uh, from me to you. Uh, how to choose uh, the best uh, target uh, journal when uh, research was conducted? Uh, is it depend on uh, type of research? I mean, uh, case-based review, systematic review, narrative review, cohort study. Uh, what is your suggestion? What are your suggestions uh, on this okay, point? Thank you. Uh, different specialists at different uh, step of their career may choose different target journals. Students, medical students may, may target uh, medical students journal. Uh, PhD candidates need Scopus and uh, Web of Science indexed journals for their studies uh, to claim that they published in peer-reviewed uh, sources. Uh, if we have different types of uh, papers, we may choose specific journals. If our data are groundbreaking, something innovative, uh, deserve Nobel Prize, then we may uh, target Nature, Science, Lancet, Cell, other journals. Uh, but we should also care uh, about local Eastern European journals. I, and I know that uh, numerous local journals are uh, non-anglophone non journals struggle to collect quality data and they damage their reputation, distract good authors. Our aim is to help Eastern European local journals to improve their uh, position, change their language to English, and publish English articles, attract good or influential authors. This is very useful strategy to uh, attract good, to make your journal a good target for global audience. And of course, uh, today we are going to discuss how to make local journal uh, a good target for global audience. Thank you very much, uh, Armen. Uh, unfortunately, our other speaker, Dr. Latika Gupta, is not with us uh, because she feels uh, bad, probably because of COVID-19. We don't know what happened. Uh, and uh, Dr. Armen uh, generously agreed uh, to present uh, this uh, lecture uh, on um, uh, importance uh, of um, uh, social media channels uh, for uh, post-publication article promotion for uh, all uh, stakeholders, uh, authors, uh, editors. Uh. Okay, we discussed yes. with Latika Gupta uh, the uh, topic of this presentation. Uh, 
uh, her approach is slightly different than than mine but we i latica you olena are all involved in social media promotion and we know that uh, social uh, media channels of journals are helpful um, for journals applying to Scopus, Web of Science. Uh, there are some specific points related to social media promotion and I am uh, now going to discuss these points. Hopefully today's uh, newcomers of this webinar series will learn uh, these points, will register with Twitter, uh, will have uh, on Facebook free groups. Uh, the importance of these groups on Facebook, public groups, not closed public groups on Facebook is important because these groups on Twitter, on Facebook, primarily, uh, they analyze scholarly articles and these articles are then uh, presented to audience. So you increase importance of these articles by commenting, by retweeting, disseminating these articles. Uh, it's something alternative to citations. So in our era, we need citations, we analyze citations, and our research can be also based on citations and on social media metrics. So again, we need ethical norms, standards to work with um, um, social media. We should stick to uh, research reporting standards of uh, International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, Council of Science Editors, Committee on Publication Ethics, and me, we also know that there is specific uh, blog, social media channel, which is actively discussing, commenting on published articles, which some, most of them are retracted. So Retraction Watch is a hub for uh, research reporting, uh, uh, post-publication -pub uh, uh, promotion. And these, are based on certain ethical standards. Uh, Committee on Publication Ethics has its own standards for post-publication promotion. Please note that uh, uh, COP published 10 points in their merged updated recommendations core, called core practices, and these core, core practices should be in, incorporated in instructions for authors. So 10th point of co uh, core practices tells us that there should be a policy of post-publication promotion of published articles uh, for ethical promotion of main points and uh, in an ethical way. So they presented Papier, but I would also consider Twitter as an ethical channel for post-publication promotion. Social media itself is a keyword uh, registered with medical subject headings related to a number of other keywords, and it was registered in 2012. So you see that social media is relatively new phenomenon uh, in the field of medicine, biomedicine and uh, allied disciplines. Social media is based on uh, public open channels for post-publication promotion or blogs. So in the last 10 uh, years, uh, social media uh, over the past 10 years, it has become uh, an essential part of our research and most articles published within the past uh, five, 10 years are abundantly commented on social media channels, various me uh, social media channels, and we may uh, obtain aggregate information about um, social media promotion of individual articles. So now I used social media as a keyword uh, which is registered with MESH, medical subject heading, uh, also registered with Excerpta Medica 3, EM3, 
uh, keywords thesaurus of uh, LCVM or Embase. And we see that a num the number of articles related or tagged with this keyword is more than 81,000. And I listed here uh, articles with uh, uh, various citation uh, counts. So the top cited article is published by economists. So we also know that social media also relates to language, computer science, information management. You see this oldest article is uh, well, uh, reasonably well commented on altmetrics.com. And I hope that today's participants will also pay attention to this altmetrics donut ring, which contains uh, um, algorithmically calculated score called uh, altmetric attention score. Uh, more than 130, which is uh, largely based on tweets. So we see that 83 Twitter users tweeted on this uh, article and more than uh, 5,400 uh, authors cited this article in their uh, articles, in their own articles. So this article is important. It's a, a classic article part of uh, citation classics. Citation classics articles are used by specialists to understand the importance of discipline. So PhD specialists will also deal with citation classics articles, highly cited articles, which are well accepted by professional community and should be uh, used to understand, to delve deeper into the subject, understand why these highly cited articles or abundantly commented on social media are important in their field of interest. In Scopus, we also analyze another important aspect of this article, of these articles, more than 81,000. We analyze annual publication activity, so pay attention if uh, the graph shows increase, annual increase of publication activity. It means that this topic is hugely important. If we have opposite picture, opposite trend, it means uh, decreasing publication activity, annual publication activity, it means that our subject is not useful, not in, uh, interesting. Uh, for global audience. So number of article is declining annually. So we also pay attention to where these articles are published. So I mentioned about computer science and we also have uh, computer science uh, periodicals or uh, proceedings publishing social media articles. We also pay attention that we may pay attention to countries, top 10 countries dealing with social media. And of course, US, uh, United Kingdom are the most active, top two most active countries discussing social media because social media, Twitter and English are interconnected and in, uh, are now part of globally important research. So social media uh, relates to ethical research, to uh, methodology of research, to uh, implications of research. We all we should take into account all these aspects uh, of research and publishing. We pay attention to uh, keywords. Um, computer specialists, IT specialists may use these keywords related to 81,000 articles, uh, primarily tagged with social media. May analyze and by cloud-based technique and provide uh, some conclusions which uh, fields of uh, social media are important. So-called semantic analysis of keywords. Semanticos, Greek word means meaning. So if we understand meaning of these numbers and keywords, so qualitative analysis of our uh, cloud of keywords, we may understand which clouds are larger, 
uh, more important and we may focus our research on large clouds, trendy clouds and continue research in this field. Social media channels are used by students and I refer here to um, non-medical journal uh, that analyzed educational activities of students and they found out that again it was survey survey uh, yielded 90% uh, of students as a respondents used Facebook uh, much less 37 used Twitter for the students life students activities student research uh, other types uh, Google plus LinkedIn LinkedIn is also considered as social media, but usually it's used for business purposes. So <clears throat> survey, again, we see range. We, they asked students how <clears throat> long they use social media channels uh, on a daily basis. And they found out that uh, they students used from 10 to 60 minutes on a day on an average day, social media. So we may also provide uh, an average uh, estimate of social media activities if we know minimum and maximum uh, values of our variable of that range. So what was purpose of using, using so, uh, employing social media for socializing? Uh, of course, it was in pre-pandemic uh, era, th this study. So socializing was important and uh, exchanging views, ideas for entertainment. Social media was used. Uh, partly social media was used for building academic profile of students, particularly Twitter. Twitter is a serious uh, channel and only advanced students, advanced academics are uh, using uh, Twitter and in my uh, humble opinion uh, Twitter is uh, important uh, uh, in the era of pandemic without Twitter we cannot run research we cannot uh, expand our research network and journals cannot survive uh, and cannot compete with other journals so Twitter and other social media channels are important countries uh, that restrict use of social media, China, some uh, Eastern Mediterranean countries, they deprive their scholars from in essentially important, critically important channel for communication and doing quality research. So use social media channels for research, run surveys using Twitter, collect data using Twitter channel, uh, count tweets and use these numbers for your uh, post publication for research based on post publication data. Social media is important also for medical education and I refer to one of the top uh, medical education journals, Academic Medicine. And again, I see that this, ultimate, uh, this article, which is a systematic review, uh, well commented on social media, particularly on Twitter. 343 Twitter users commented on this article. We see also bloggers commented, uh, referred to this article. So um, social media in education, how you can learn message from this article. So your students, good, those who are good at English, they can run blogs, student blogs. They can uh, improve their English writing by blogging. And you can also ask your medical students, this on, um, uh, which are now um, on online medical education, you can ask them to write brief blogs, brief essays, submit uh, or uh, reposit on certain medical education blocks and evaluate these activities as medical education activities. 
So you can also use Wikipedia. Unfortunately, in Eastern Europe, in uh, Eastern Mediterranean, academics are not uh, familiar or not good at using Wikipedia for um, uh, social media pur purposes. But it has its own advantages and it weighed high uh, in by Altmetrics Attention Com, Altmetrics.com. Uh, social media tools frequently used by uh, for medical education based on this systematic review are Twitter and Facebook. Twitter, why we use Twitter? Twitter is used for uh, is used for so-called tweet chats. It's um, again specific channels. Uh, these channels, uh, tweet chats, can be used by lecturers during their lecture. Uh, lectures, presentations, they can attract their audience by tweeting. And we have Room at Room Journal Club, which is also considered as a tweet chat for rheumatologists. rheumatologists. Uh, social media for different research groups, how different research groups use, let's say, uh, faculty members or journal editors. So you should specify and you may also as journal editors um, or heads of departments, you can also refer to these tips of social media use. So you should hire professional social media moderator or coordinator uh, because uh, social media is a double-edged sword and without help of professional sir, uh, editors, professional specialists, you cannot uh, run good social media channel for your journal, for your department, university, etc. Consult accounts of top journals. It's, it specifically refers to journal editors. In our field, let's say in rheumatology, we pay attention to top rheumatology journals, their uh, Twitter channels, Twitter account, accounts and pay attention how they promote articles, which type of articles they promote. You cannot promote everything on social media, on Twitter. There are some limitations and you should be aware of these ethical and other limitations. You should regularly expand your work. You should block those unethical users, those using Twitter or uh, other social media channels for uh, non-academic purposes, simply block and exclude these illiterate or, or, uh, or uh, users who abuse uh, others and use social media channels for promotion of their individual interests. So you should also pay attention to top professional associations. We refer to rheumatology professional associations and their uh, channels, Twitter or Facebook channels, Twitter is open channel, Facebook has options for closed and open uh, groups. So usually it's better to have open channel for public distribution. Uh, I, I told you about uh, checking and blocking unethical users, avoid uh, promotion of certain drugs, let's say hydroxychloroquine, if you specifically or uh, um, somehow uh, unobject, uh, um, without any evidence, you promote certain drug like hydroxychloroquine, you may violate uh, ethical norms of social media uh, promotion. Uh, try social media um, editors or coordinators should promote articles or subject matters re related to certain groups. Uh, they cannot promote and they are not, it's not ethical to promote something irrelevant. Uh, let's say if it is journal, so stick to your journal and avoid uh, promoting other journals stuff. There should be, there can be conflict of interest. So be very careful, stick to your journal, to your department, to your university or your university account cannot promote another university uh, um, 
proceedings or another university activities. Uh, avoid any materials related to pharmaceutical industry, particularly if uh, you or your department is a grant recipient from a certain pharmaceutical industry. Uh, when you publish article, try to encourage your American and other Anglo, uh, Anglophone authors to share their Twitter handle, handles and list these Twitter handles uh, next to ORCID IDs. It will help to increase visibility and to increase also a promotion of articles. And of course, you should stick to Creative Commons uh, licenses of distribution, avoid unethical or uh, avoid violation of copyrights, avoid uh, distributing um, photographs of patients, uh, blinded or unblinded, must or unmust patients. So, because public accounts are viewed also by patients and they can be also influenced by your distribution activities. Examples of good journals, top rheumatology journals, in your field, you may also have uh, top journals. I hope that all today's specialists know about Saimago Journal and Country Rank and use that, that free platform to, uh, to follow top journals in their field. Pay attention whether they're top journals in your field of interest, your uh, academic discipline, have good Twitter channel. You see top rheumatology journal generated uh, about 3,700 tweets. Each of these tweets is with graphical material, with links to articles, so uh, sizable amount. This journal also has uh, 6,390 followers. Again, huge number. And uh, probably editor of this account uh, regularly expands a list of followers, but they follow only a couple of hundreds of followers. So it's normal. Uh, it's important to expand list of followers somehow to attract, to encourage them to uh, promote journal during conferences, during webinars and attract followers to a Twitter account. Another rheumatology journal, the same story, and you also pay attention to dates of registration. So these are old channels registered five, 10 years ago. So uh, in the past 10 year, we have um, uh, resur resurgence of um, social media activities using Twitter. So it's important. It's also important to have several social media coordinators. Uh, who will have access to social media account and will actively promote different types of articles. You see that these top rheumatology journals have uh, numerous social media coordinators. How journals use social media for uh, social media promotion? Uh, an article published on PubMed, easy to promote using social media plugins, Twitter, Facebook, and, other, and another plugin. So please use these plugins and uh, navigate from these plugins to your uh, social media uh, account. And you may also add a few words, act as a microblogger. Most social media activities are tracked uh, on dimensions and newly uh, new journals, emerging journals, uh, extensively use dimensions or digital science services. It's something similar to Google, uh, so-called competitor of Google. The same, uh, almost the same uh, tactics, strategy of uh, promotion uh, and um, tracking of citations and social media activities. Google cannot, social cannot track social media activities, whereas dimensions uh, is integrated with altmetrics.com and uh, generate altmetrics donut rings. 
some journals also have uh, uh, these plugins, social media plugins, uh, attached to uh, pages of individual articles. Again, you can uh, distribute or share these articles, information about these articles using these specific plugins. Twitter helps us to increase inform uh, distribute information within short period time post publication. After that short, short period of time, usually you know, weeks, months, uh, citations become uh, important players for post-publication promotion. So Twitter immediacy effect, immediate effect is short-lived within few days, few weeks, uh, one month or few months. So it helps to generate feeds to an article. Uh, if you tweet with professional comment, uh, it depends on a uh, way of your pro professional comment. Let's say you uh, put that this article is important, recommended for uh, community, then yes, that article will be weighed more than an art another article just tweeted without professional comment. Uh, retweets uh, create so-called resonance like uh, likes. You can like, you can also retweet, but these are not counted. You need professional comments. Tweets are openly visible. Uh, it's good because Twitter is open channel, so you can use it. Tweets are uh, more in numbers and increase uh, visibility of articles more than Facebook, particularly Facebook uh, closed group uh, entries, mentions, Facebook mentions, and there is no, at the moment, uh, only few studies confirm that number of tweets uh, correlates with a number of citations to individual articles. These association or cor correlation is valid for medical or clinical sciences. In non-clinical sciences, where number of Twitter users is low, this association is not so uh, certain. Twitter offers scholars opportunities to push, to promote articles, their articles. Uh, and it's not dependent on pools. Pools are more related to bibliographic searches, retrievals from bibliographic searches. So there is a difference. You see here an example in academic, academic medicine journal. First of all, it's a good uh, example of uh, Twitter channel, but it's also a good example how they promote individual articles. They ask their authors, US best based authors, to uh, put Twitter handle, Twitter address of their account next to their uh, email or ORCID ID. So Twitter handles, Twitter profiles are also considered as IDs. So a solid or reputable profile of an academic, especially of a scholar should have uh, ORCID, well-edited uh, ORCID profile, uh, good active Twitter handle, and of course, email for post-publication promotion, for respond, to respond to uh, reader questions, etc., etc. An example how journal tracks and reports in, uh, citation and alternative metric information. So you see a basket of metrics, so-called basket. You see a number of uh, metrics used to promote article and to put it on a website. So you see also from altmetrics.com, trendy articles. Scientists, let's say in uh, psychiatry, in veterinary medicine, non-medical specialists, sociologists may also use these trendy articles to understand how uh, readers or society perceived or uh, um, their sentiment towards published articles in certain journals. 
Uh, why I mentioned these basket metrics? Because from 2012, DORA initiative, uh, Declaration on Research Assessment, you can also become a signat signatory of this initiative by going to their website and uh, filling uh, their signing uh, their declaration as an individual scholar or uh, as, a, as an organization, journal, association. So they published uh, their declaration. One of these uh, points refers to a basket, to a basket of metrics. So nowadays we should refer to a number of scholarly metrics to judge or evaluate importance of individual articles, individual authors, and journals. So journals with two-year impact factor alone cannot be, uh, it's difficult to understand how that journal is uh, important to uh, the community. We should also understand whether the journal is commented on altmetrics.com, on uh, whether it is um, cited by authors publishing in Scopus index journals, uh, in Web of Science index journals, so variety of metrics. Please, if you are editors of journals, go to DORA and register with DORA initiative. Individual scholars can also do that, uh, simply to understand the importance of you know, research managers, university uh, administrators. Uh, uh, I refer now to a survey of rheumatologists more than 200 rheumatologists were asked in pre-COVID-19 uh, era, and they were asked how long uh, they are active on social media. Busy clinicians were active just six hours uh, per week. And I'm sure nowadays uh, the situation uh, could be different. I mentioned about some surveys as a cross-sectional studies, observational studies. And I mentioned that surveys are valid, their results are valid for a certain period of time. Uh, next month, next year, survey results can be, or cross-sectional results can be different. But it's easy to uh, run surveys and somehow these are important. So they use 91% uh, uh, of young rheumatologists, youngsters, they use Facebook. They use for different purposes, academic purposes, to receive uh, rheumatology. Half of uh, respondents mentioned research uh, and clinical practice uh, for, uh, and only one third mentioned that they needed skills to uh, benefit from social media activities. So even anyone, any uh, scholar need skills to use Twitter, Facebook, to open our own uh, team channel and use social media for scholarly purposes. Believe me, social media channels are becoming uh, important, uh, crucial for academic promotion, for increasing visibility of individual journals and individual uh, articles. So a few technical tips for those who are new to Twitter or primarily Twitter. Uh, you should enter tweets or comments uh, with a quite limited number of sign, uh, symbols. Uh, let's say 140. Uh, your tweets or uh, comments on Twitter may contain photos, videos, links. Uh, you may also use hashtags to increase retrievability of your tweets. The same with uh, keywords of uh, articles. You may tag specialists, uh, special, uh, in, um, in especially interested users whom you uh, ask to pay attention to your tweet. These can be individual users, professional associations. Uh, use uh, short links to journal URLs. For that, we have Bitly or other services to shorten 
these links and you are also asked to, to generate tweets on certain period of time during the day. Why? Because you uh, may miss your main readers. Your readers can be active during uh, other times. And there is also a service to analyze when your, your uh, interested groups are active. Uh, there is no need to, you, uh, to generate numerous 10, 20, 100 tweets at a time. It's not useful, it's counterproductive. Contra, uh, try it and it's called robot activity or bot activity uh, in terms of uh, Twitter activities, bot activities. Sometimes it's also unethical when you promote one idea and you simply push your uh, tweets, the same tweet or slightly different tweets in, with um, numerous tweets suggesting uh, the same thing. So you see uh, Twitter graphs can be also analyzed uh, let's say on this graph uh, Twitter users of interest I mean, US based Twitter users were active uh, during afternoon time and uh, late evening time so you can you kn knowing these activities you can generate your tweet to attract certain groups and of course uh, we need certain ethical standards, ethical norms. And I'm happy that uh, Dr. Zimba published a set of uh, ethical standards for social media activities, uh, particularly for medics, but I'm sure that allied specialists will also benefit from these uh, tips. And some journals now uh, incorporated these points in their instructions for authors and publication ethics statements acceptable strategies for social media use, uh, keep to high standards of online communication, be accountable, be responsible for what you generate, be sure that you are uh, disseminating evidence-based information, draft guidelines uh, for each community, so rheumatologists or uh, cardiologists, veterinary specialists may have their own set of social media promotion uh, norms. So it uh, varies from uh, discipline to discipline. Protect uh, interests of your patients. Uh, avoid uh, disseminating identifiable information, information about certain drug medical technologies, particularly if there is no strong evidence base. In conclusion for this part, scholars are encouraged to familiarize themselves with social media channels, particularly Twitter. Please register with Twitter and join our post-publication promotion. And when you see a target journal without social media promotion, it means that they are not up to date. So it means that they uh, are not, they uh, do not care of social media promotion. Uh, Olena, over to you. Uh, dear Arman, uh, thank you very much for your excellent uh, presentation. Uh, it's really true that uh, social media activity uh, is not a waste of time. It's really important for uh, example for academic promotion, for promotion of our published uh, articles. Uh, and nowadays uh, we don't have a choice uh, on whether we do social media. The question is how well we do it. But we should remember that uh, social media channels uh, is a double H sword. You told about this and can be also not only a source of reliable uh, and relevant information, but also can be uh, as a source uh, of misinformation, especially uh, at the time of um, a pandemic uh, COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I am sure that after your uh, lecture, our participants <laughs> will open own, uh, for example, Twitter accounts. Uh, thank you very much. So it's uh, a culture of academic activities. If you do not use 
Twitter, particularly in the time of pandemic, it means that you do not understand. So you are not uh, ideal academic. So all academics should use Twitter channel uh, to promote their own articles, respond to reader uh, comments. And Twitter as a public channel is the ideal channel for social media communication. Hopefully all your local journals will also set their Twitter accounts. It's quite serious, serious and will amend the instructions for authors informing their readers that they care a lot and they promote articles of their authors on social media channels. Without journals, with, with poor Twitter channels, uh, with only a few uh, uh, tweets, uh, or uh, just uh, they do it just to uh, impress, to show off that they have Twitter channel. No, they should use Twitter channels to actively promote articles. The best editors are those who have their active Twitter channels. They have uh, professional social media editors like you. you I know that you uh, actively work for several index journals and uh, your services are uh, truly impressive. So taking this opportunity, I thank you, your department and your university for your activities. You keep high your mark your individual mark and also mark of your department. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really love oh, this job. Uh, comment from uh, Vasily Lunchina. Uh, okay. Your classic yes. social media articles are old, um, uh, but uh, if I correctly understood, you demonstrated uh, uh, article with the highest number of citations. Yes? Uh, yes. So mm -hmm. I, I want, yeah, I wanted to uh, show highly cited article and classic uh, cl article that still contains a number of tweets. So if I un uh, start analyzing, uh, analyzing all these tweets, I'll uh, show that still up to now, this classical article is tweeted. So we may also analyze this type of, we perform this type of analysis and understand that over the past 10 years, this classical article is well read well commented and have uh, uh, societal impact. Okay, what was the question of Professor Lanchina? Uh, have you any 2020 references uh, which you would like to recommend uh, to our participants? Uh, so they should know uh, that uh, it was excellent question, yes. I had to choose something new with high number of tweets. Yeah, uh, to uh, understand importance of tweets. But they should also understand that there are some article types which are highly commented. Olena, you know which article types are highly commented on Twitter? Uh, which uh, kind of articles, for example, uh, these uh, impressive uh, images, uh, case-based review, clinical cases, interesting, yes. In my experience, practice guidelines are highly commented and, of course. and highly disseminated. So if uh, we uh, refer to uh, newest or latest articles, high number of tweets will be for practice guidelines or recommendations of professional societies or something impressive. You told us about case reports. Yes, this is why some journals continue publishing case reports or image articles, just one image and brief explanation yes. of that image. And this type of articles attract a lot of readers. Yes, yes. And in current era of pandemic, we also have a number of COVID-19 articles so it's a type of articles, COVID-19 articles, which are uh, abundantly commented on social media, Twitter, because Twitter is the uh, fastest channel of sharing information about uh, scholarly articles. So hopefully I uh, satisfied uh, Professor Lanchina's <laughs> interest in this, not interest, a question. 
Well, uh, let's move on to the next uh, item of our agenda. Your next uh, presentation is uh, really important uh, for authors, for editors. Uh, it's about conflict of interests. Okay. Because not, uh, not all authors uh, are enough familiar with uh, this uh, really important uh, issue. Well, uh, this presentation is important to PhD candidates, to those with uh, extensive ties uh, with the pharmaceutical industry, to Eastern European and your local journals, which are manipulated uh, by pharmaceutical industry. And it's also important for journal editors applying to Scopus or Embase. If you publish articles about drug therapies, medical technologies, you should pay attention to conflicts of interest. So what authors and editors should know? <clears throat> uh, editors should know that all these editorial associations and Office of Research Integrity, they have points about conflicts of interest statements. For PhD candidates, I mentioned this uh, option of analyzing research subject, research topic, and hope that uh, in your PhD dissertations, these option will be incorporated, somehow will be visible, how you explored field of your interest. So first of all, pay attention to a num to number of articles in your field when you search through Scopus, Web of Science, PubMed. So here I refer to Scopus. I see 2,400, more than 2,400 articles related to conflicts of interest in publishing. I choose uh, these two uh, keywords. And I pay attention to an in uh, increasing number, annual number of publication, publications related to conflicts of interest. I know that medics are active, but also in social sciences, also there are many uh, concerns about conflict of interest disclosures, and they also publish a lot uh, about conflicts of interest. Countries active in the field of conflict of interest are, of course, top two countries, United Kingdom and United States and United Kingdom. Of course, well-developed countries, developed countries are concerned because they published um, articles which then may influence practice guidelines and they should explicitly provide information about author's conflict of interest to inform readers that everything is reliable in articles and not biased because of uh, author's connections to pharmaceutical industry. So uh, PhD candidates should also analyze in their field of interest top 10 or top uh, 20 countries uh, most active in the field of uh, their research. They should pay attention to journals actively publishing this type of articles here. Nature, top scientific article concerned with conflicts of interest. Top 10 are uh, authors actively publishing on COVID, uh, on conflicts of interest are editors of British Medical Journal, editor of Lancet, editors of JAMA, and also Sheldon Kotzin, uh, librarian, former uh, director of Medline Evaluation Team. So he was also, uh, so Medline concerns about conflicts of interest, and they pay attention to conflicts of interest disclosures in individual articles. So if your journal uh, submitted to Scopus evaluation or Medline evaluation, they may pay attention to your publication ethics statement, but they may also delve deeper and an, uh, analyze uh, 10, 20 articles with uh, disclosures where the conflicts of interest is di disclosed. What we have in Eastern Europe, numerous articles with pharmaceutical industry connections uh, promoting specific drugs, osteoporosis drugs or other drugs without disclosures that these articles are promotional and these articles are sponsored. So these type of articles are hardly publishable uh, by indexed journals. 
And if you publish uh, these type of articles in your journals, I, I know that uh, there are some rheumatology journals in Eastern Europe continuing publishing uh, promotional articles just to attract small amount of money for from pharmaceutical industry. They damage reputation of their journal and indexability of their journals. So again, I used the same uh, option from Scopus anal analysis to understand which articles are highly cited in this field. I see that nepotism and sexism in peer review, classical article published in Nature in 1994, is cited more than 700 times. So second important article is Cochrane, data, Cochrane Review, Systematic Review, published in 2012. So I will now analyze alternative attention to second article, Cochrane uh, Systematic Review. It's a classical article, but still uh, highly commented on social media, particularly more than 400 tweets. And again, you see this article is dealing with uh, pharmaceutical industry and uh, author, I pay uh, uh, attention to author's conclusion in this Cochrane systematic review, telling us that we should be very careful with uh, drug uh, agency sponsored trials and other publications which lack reliability and we cannot use this type of article for our practice guidelines for treating our patients. We should critically analyze information from journals, uh, from journals and articles uh, related to pharmaceutical industry. So pay also attention to map of social media activity related to this systematic review. You see a blue part uh, dark color, US, and you see gray color. Gray color means that there is no any social media activity uh, related to this article. So in this gray part of the world, in Eurasia, in Kazakhstan, in China, no one is interested in industry-sponsored articles lack of disclosures of conflict of interest. So it's quite typical because in this part of world, numerous articles are generated without disclosure of conflict of interest with heavy links to pharmaceutical industry. So their research activities, their publications cannot be used or can be used for practice guidelines with caution. When we analyze conflicts of interest, we uh, should uh, pay attention to interchangeable terms. Competition of interest or competing interest. In England, we use competing interest. In US, specialists use conflicts of interest as a uh, keyword. So we uh, may refer to Wikipedia def definition and all our participants of webinar also know that we frequently use Wikipedia definition for our lectures, for our presentations, and we simply copy their definition. It's a copy, but still I uh, refer to Wikipedia. What is, what constitutes conflict of interest? If we have primary interest and th that primary interest is in conflict to secondary interest, we uh, end up with conflict of interest. So primary interest is good service uh, or uh, attention to our patients' needs, patients' health care. Secondary interest is support from pharmaceutical industry and other subjective interests, which are common conflicts of interest, self-dealing. It often refers to journals in Eastern Europe. Uh, many times I uh, or I deal with uh, Eastern European journals uh, where in a, in a single journal issue, chief editor publishes numerous articles and none of these articles are peer reviewed or all these articles are uh, evaluated and accepted 
by chief editor, none other than chief editor. So family interest called nepotism is also a common type of interest. You probably know about that. Let's say PhD dissert dissertants or candidates know about that. If they uh, compete with uh, others, they know chances of uh, defendants are high. If they have close relations or family relations with head of uh, PhD defendants, head, uh, PhD defendants uh, group. Favors from pharmaceutical industry also constitute common types of conflicts of interest. When we refer to MESH keyword, uh, which was registered in 1991, we also see the same definition of conflict of interest, private or primary interest in conflict to secondary interests. The same uh, was used by BMJ. So any journal, each journal uh, should have definition of conflict of interest in their instructions for authors and uh, in publication ethics statements with links to global editorial associations. And they should explain their authors how to avoid conflicts of interest or how to disclose real or per and perceived conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest is a part of corruption continuum. So it's problem for closed or small professional communities. We all know each other and there is conflicts of interest. So conflicts of interest is a part of corruption uh, and uh, misconduct uh, continuum in small, closed or uh, emerging research communities. Uh, roots of conflicts of interest uh, relate not just to uh, author activities, but also to reviewer, journal publisher, editor activities. Mm, conflicts of interest in medicine relate to pers and in biomedicine, veterinary medicine as well. In journal publication relate to personal, commercial, political, religious. So let's say we have uh, submissions from Pakistan and India. And if uh, we have a single blind system, uh, reviewers and uh, know that it's an article from their competitors, they may harshly criticize without any objective or without any evidence base. So be very careful and try to avoid this type of conflict as, uh, as well. So try to in, uh, invite specialists free of conflicts of interest. There are some professional, financial, and non-financial uh, conflicts of interest. When you ask as authors to disclose your conflicts of interest, it's uh, not just financial. You also have some non-financial conflicts of interest to disclose as well. Even if you, are, uh, if you do not perceive these as potential conflicts of interest. Roots of conflicts of interest. Of course, if you have small journal, if you have a small pool of reviewers, you will have a lot of conflicts of interest and it will damage uh, indexability of your journal. Conflicts of interest in research papers, particularly in US, when uh, pharmaceutical industry hires specialists uh, and uh, these specialists, medical writers write uh, primary ver uh, first versions of articles, then someone eminent professors put their names in these articles. It's huge conflict of interest. It's uh, research, uh, publication, violation of publication ethics norms and should be avoided. And it is based on conflicts of interest and also should be carefully dealt with by journal editors. Um, so Singapore statement on research integrity defined conflicts of interest and asked researchers to disclose any financial or non-financial conflict of interest. And these message was to authors, refer, convey to authors, reviewers, and editors. Uh, COP core practices referred to conflicts of interest. And again, they emphasized importance of uh, strategies to deal with conflicts of interest at each step of processing research manuscripts. So all specialists, all scholars should uh, disclose their research interests, conflicts of interest. They should use 
International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, conf conflict of interest structured form. Veterinary specialists, psychiatrists can also use those uh, EMT specialists, pediatric specialists, almost all specialists may benefit. And uh, it's easy to fill in this form because it's structured with closed questions, easy to answer, and they ask uh, whether uh, the authors, reviewers, and editors uh, have had any conflict, uh, any relations with pharmaceutical industry within the past three years. Uh, easy to uh, fill, to find this form and fill in to submit to a number of journals. When this form introduced in 2010, before 2010, there wasn't any conflict of interest form. This form helped to increase to double disclosure of conflicts of interest. So we have evidence from Deutsches Arzeblatt, one of the top German journals. So it's good evidence against based on uh, a cohort of articles, section of articles. Japanese specialists analyzed, again, uh, it was a cross-sectional study, a sample of articles, they analyzed sample of articles, and noticed a sample of journals and noticed that only 67% of Japanese journals had conflicts of interest statements. So it should be 100%. Author forms, different types of author disclosure forms are available. You can have your own. If you are a specialist in sociology, arts and humanities, non-medics, you can have your own uh, form for conflicts of inter interest uh, disclosure. So World Association of Medical uh, Editors uh, encouraged uh, their editors to carefully deal with, uh, and they also encouraged editors, reviewers, and authors to disclose financial and non-financial conflicts of interest. Council of Science editors uh, particularly emphasized non-financial conflicts of interest. Here is an example how best top rheumatology journal encourages uh, authors, reviewers, and editors to disclose their conflicts of interest. They mention specific types of conflicts of interest, and these are included in their instructions for authors. Now you see that BMG, BMJ journals, British Medical uh, Journal series, they also have disclosures for chief editors on their websites. And you see that the, this chief editor of Top Rheumatology Journal has a number of links to pharmaceutical industry through practice guideline development teams. So it's ethical to disclose and then publish and run journal. Another past uh, editor of uh, another example, how they uh, disclosed their uh, conflicts of interest. I published an article uh, about conflicts of interest, which was one of the first article uh, emphasizing importance of conflicts of interest for all stakeholders in scholarly communications. And we analyzed uh, a sample of rheumatology journals indexed by Scopus. And we anal uh, noticed that not all uh, rheumatology journals, only 70%, only one third of top rheumatology journals disclosed, provided uh, tips how to disclose conflicts of interest in their instructions for authors. So uh, editors have um, a number of uh, financial uh, uh, conflicts of interest disclosure, particularly those dealing with drug therapies, journals in pharmacy, pharmacology, toxicology. Uh, some of these journals affect also uh, guideline developments. They should pay attention to review a conflict of interest and they should have uh, tag, um, forms included that include questions to uh, reviewers about their conflicts of interest, um, what type of conflicts of interest should be disclosed. And there is evidence that clinical trials with uh, heavy links to pharmaceutical industry, sponsored by pharmaceutical industry, provide positive comments about drug therapies. No, any negative comments. So more and more uh, policies of journals, top journals like British Medical Journal, avoid 
publishing clinical trials with heavy links to pharmaceutical industry. There are other types of conflicts of interest, uh, particularly those affecting citations as well. More citations, more interest of pro professional community and more incorporation in practice guidelines. So these type of articles are usually sponsored by pharmaceutical industry and how they promote, they simply publish reprints. So it's old practice of promoting articles. You probably know, know that uh, during conferences in your part of world, pharmaceutical industry also selects articles promoting their uh, drugs, printing reprints, disseminating and increasing attention to their articles. So it's also conflict of interest. More and more conferences get rid of this type of promotion. Uh, research, uh, randomized controlled trials are heavily sponsored, you probably know, and research reporting standards now also include statements about conflicts of interest. Uh, half of clinical guidelines are based on sub sponsors, pharmaceutical industry, and they uh, damage uh, evidence synthesis. synthesis. There should, should be a policy to correct avoid these conflicts in top journals, particularly in Lancet, BMJ, and uh, top uh, other journals. We analyzed guidelines, practice recommendations in the field of rheumatology uh, a few years ago. And we know, noticed that some of these, only handful of uh, practice recommendations contain disclosures of authors' conflicts of interest. You see, uh, ankylosing spondylitis treatment uh, recommendations for management of ankylosing spondylitis and no any competing interest. It's relatively old conflict uh, practice guidelines, but new practice guidelines contain a large uh, section on conflicts of interest disclosure. So all uh, scholars are now concerned with manipulation by pharmaceutical industry and I ask you and your journal editors to disclose all uh, relationship with pharmaceutical industry. Otherwise, your journal will not be indexed by Scopus. Scopus experts are well informed that uh, journals publishing pharmaceutical uh, industry sponsored uh, articles are not indexable. So even do not apply to Scopus if you have this type of articles. Uh, so promoted articles, promotional articles. And even FDA uh, also um, has uh, approved some of uh, drugs because of their concealed uh, connections, not uh, easily visible connections with pharmaceutical industry. Probably uh, hydroxychloroquine, which was also recommended uh, uh, remdesivir, which uh, COVID-19 drug, which was also recommended for treatment of uh, COVID-19, also approved by pharmaceutical for FDA, and hope, probably that was also partly because of connection to pharmaceutical industry. So we all, as authors, reviewers, and editors, should know that global editorial associations have uh, conflicts of interest statements, we should refer to this statement, we should revise conflicts of interest statements in our uh, instructions for authors and publication ethics statements, and particularly before uh, submission of our application to Scopus and Web of Science. Over to you. Uh, dear Arman, uh, now we know almost all about conflict of interest. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we have some comments uh, from our participants uh, from Olesya Cherny, Cafedra Otolaryngology, uh, Lviv National Medical University. Um, Thank you. Uh, from Basiri Lunchina, your lectures are excellent. Thank you. Thank you and one, yes, one more comment from Professor Luncina, as a result of the information about predatory journals, where the editor publishes many of his her articles in the journal, 
I came across such a situation in a recent review for a prestigious journal. Your information opened my eyes to this practice. <laughs> Thank you. And one more comment from uh, Vasily Lunchina. Uh, uh, conflict of interest statements rely on the integrity of the author to disclose. Uh, if an editor discovers that uh, indeed an author has a conflict of interest, uh, is that reason to withdraw a paper or retract it? Okay, excellent question by uh, one of the uh, US-based specialist in ethics, research and publication ethics, Professor Lanchina, who runs also bioethics course uh, in uh, Lviv, Catholic University. So uh, I know that uh, he is right that predatory journals publish promotional articles with uh, full, uh, without disclosure of uh, pharma in connections with pharmaceutical industry, uh, with uh, rosy data, positive data about drug therapies. And I am sure that many uh, misleading articles also rejected by prestigious journals end up in predatory journals. Predatory journals can be open access subscription journals if they do not stick to uh, research and publication ethics norms. They publish articles with uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, disclosure, not enough if there is strong connection with pharmaceutical industry and article is full of conflicts of interest, so that article cannot be accepted. So second part of his comment, uh, art, uh, comment and uh, question was about uh, withdrawal, uh, rejection and retraction of this type of articles. Yes, he is right. If there is a conflict of interest in manuscript or published article, and that conflict of interests uh, disqualifies conclusion of original research paper, systematic review, narrative review, uh, or editorial, even editorial with conflicts of interest. Let's say pharma sponsored uh, expert publishes editorial and promotes in one page editorial that drug, and everyone start using that drug, which may have uh, also negative effects and damage uh, health of uh, patients. So this type of article should be retracted. He is right. And conflict of, in of interest can be also a reason for uh, withdrawal or a retraction of article if editor suspects, if he uh, asks authors to disclose, they disclose, and uh, he see conflict. He, the uh, editor, he or she may this, uh, withdraw or retract article. Yes, it's uh, acceptable uh, editorial practice. Professor Lanchini is right. Thank you very much for helping, guiding me throughout this presentation and uh, asking uh, excellent questions. And was there any question from ENT specialist? Uh, we have uh, two questions. Uh, one uh, from Serhii Sochernitsky. Uh, predatory journals are a problem indeed. What is your opinion about Bill's list? How to judge papers with multiple references in predatory uh, journals? Okay, uh, good. Uh, I should tell you that um, Jeffrey Bill, uh, I met him uh, in person. Uh, in 2014, he was active at that, it was 2015. So we met uh, and we discussed a number of issues. He was uh, proactive until uh, he uh, ran his blog, uh, scholarly open access blog, and he listed all open access predatory journals, English journals. But unfortunately, he didn't pay attention to non-Anglophone journals. And in your part of, uh, in your country and region, you have also predatory subscription and open access journal vi violating research and publication ethics norms. So his list is archive and we uh, can access that archive, Bill's list, Bill's list archive. But we also understand even without Bill, Jeffrey Bill, we now know uh, what constitutes predatory journal. 
journal with, with soft peer review, journal with a chief editor who, is, who lacks editorial credentials, journals violating um, open access uh, ethics norms, journals without uh, COP membership, without understanding of core uh, practices from uh, uh, COP, Committee on Publication Ethics. This type of journals should be disqualified and authors should avoid publishing in these journals. I know two journals heavily targeted by your authors. You probably know about these two journals as well from this region, from your region. Uh, your uh, strategic partners publish these journals. They publish everything without peer review, without conflicts of interest disclosures. I am not going to discuss these um, substandard journals, but you should know about these two journals. Stop sending journal articles to these two journals. They publish in any language, in Polish, in Russian, in German, in every any language in uh, these articles in these journals so conflicts of interest is huge issue and good journals standard journals adhering to adhering to cop standards should pay attention to conflicts of interest disclosures they should use international committee of uh, medical journal editors form for disclosure well, uh, and one more question from uh, Oksana Zajkivska. Uh, first of all, thank you for very nice presentation. Uh, what is your tips uh, how to improve uh, ethical issues uh, <clears throat> in a journal? How to avoid uh, conflict of interest issues? Okay, so uh, we should pay attention to uh, financial and non-financial. Non-financial interests are, are also important uh, because uh, the, the first example of um, non-financial uh, conflict of interest when chief editor abundantly publishes his own uh, articles in his own journal, in his or her own journal. So it's non-financial conflict of interest. To avoid eradicate this type of uh, conflicts of interest, you should regularly revise uh, your journal uh, instructions and publication ethics and publication malpractice statement. So Scopus experts are well aware of Eastern European journals uh, or any uh, or um, journals from uh, post-Soviet countries, let's say, or post-communist countries, Croatian, Bosnian, and they try to avoid this type of journals because they know that their statements are not good instructions for authors and publication ethics statements. And they also know that even if they properly edit these statements, they rarely enforce ethical statements. So they publish uh, good publication ethics statements, but uh, never ask their authors to disclose conflicts of interest, to adhere to uh, uh, COP standards, to use International Committee of Medical Journal Editors form. So try to uh, revise your instructions uh, for authors, publication ethics statements, and educate your authors how to use International Committee of Medical Journal Editors form how to correctly disclose conflicts of interest in uh, article notes. Uh, well, uh, comment from Serhii Sochilnitsky. Definition predatory is crucial for authors. For example, in academic promotion, criteria and points of definition should be an accepted uh, consensus. Uh, do you know such accepted checklist for definition predatory journal? Uh, yes, we know uh, we had a, a presentation about predatory uh, publishing practices. So we refer to uh, Jeffrey Beal. And I should also tell you that uh, as Scopus expert, I also, when I evaluate art journals, there is tick. Uh, there is a window to fill uh, whether journal is uh, can be uh, viewed as predatory. 
let's say if a journal has title European, world, or American, but this title do not correspond to author pool, authors pool, editors pool, editorial board members are from Eastern Mediterranean or from or from uh, Asia. So we may disqualify this type of journals as experts of bibliographic databases, but you also, your professional community may also inc uh, discourage your authors to circumvent this type of, avoid this type of journals. Let's say a journal is uh, titled Gior Gior Georgian uh, Social <laughs> Science, and all authors are from Ukraine. So there is discrepancy. These type of journals are, uh, of course, candidates for exclusion, and they will never be accepted by Scopus Web of Science. These type of journals are uh, potentially uh, uh, potentially candidates for uh, disqualification. So be uh, sure that uh, your authors need. Uh, to increase, they, uh, your authors need to increase their aware, awareness to uh, target good journals. And professional community should also uh, have list of acceptable journals. Let's say rheumatology community may have list of 60 journals indexed by Scopus, indexed by Web of Science, archived by PubMed Central, uh, acceptable for your research community. And this way you will ask you will uh, convey strong message to your membership tar uh, target or publish only with these journals and use these publications for your academic promotion. It's true, a high number of Ukrainian authors uh, in Georgian journal. It's really strange, yes. And one of Polish journals as well. Uh, yes. <laughs> and these journals both uh, do not have uh, peer review in place, and they simply charge authors without providing services. Services mean, means uh, substantive editing, uh, validation of references, uh, recheck of uh, statistical analysis, and a number of other services. So uh, if you pay uh, for open access publication, also ask editors to provide good quality services. Otherwise, uh, it's a waste of money. A good question from Oksana Zajkivska. Why this journal belongs uh, to Scopus? Uh, you know, as expert of uh, Scopus, I suffered a lot because of these uh, type of journals, because I informed uh, Scopus chairpersons and Scopus uh, directors and other scholars, and not just Scopus other professional uh, society uh, administrators to disqualify these journals. And these journals are now uh, stuck somewhere uh, and they are not considered for, uh, they are not um, further indexed because of their, because of violation of research, publication ethics norms. So I hope that your participants will never publish in dodgy journals. They will uh, target local journals and your local journals should increase their quality, ethical stance and attract good quality English journal, uh, English articles. That's yes. a big issue. You should solve that problem and increase attraction, uh, interest of uh, American, Western European or Anglophone authors towards your journals. Without that uh, option, you cannot, uh, indexability of your journals is low. Uh, yes, uh, we totally agree uh, with you. It's much better to publish in our local journal, uh, Medical Sciences, um, that's now listed uh, uh, by Deutsch. Good yes, news. Yes. List, lists all ethical journals. You are right. Yes. yes. So uh, all local journals should try to uh, list their, uh, register their journal with directory of open access journals. It's considered as white list or list of ethical open access journals. Deutsch, 
director of open access journals. Uh, well, thank you very much for this really thank you. valuable Shall we move? information mm -hmm. and now we come to the final uh, item of our agenda how to get indexed by scopus and web of science <laughs> like you can Ooh. share your presentation with us can you see it yes we can see your screen okay so final part of our today's uh, long webinar uh, we discussed some parts some uh, options how to increase uh, indexability of your journals and this particular part uh, refers to journal editors chief editors managing editors and hopefully authors also learn something about their target journals uh, if i have uh, seen further it is by standing on shoulders of giants so nowadays we have google as a uh, uh something helping us to stand on shoulders of giants and by having access to google by having access to open sources we increase access to scholarly information and scholarly information means a lot journal editors who wants to increase indexability of their journals should pay attention to punctuality if you have a healthy flow of submissions to your journals you may also satisfy the main criterion of publishing i am sure that soon there will be many local english journals uh, listed or uh, presented on open science in ukraine platform and all these journals will be evaluated for indexing so pay attention whether you stick to uh, timeliness of uh, publications whether your issues if uh, it's regular periodical regularly published periodical stick to schedule quarterly uh, bi-monthly or uh, by annually so let's say here is example of a publishing quarterly journal february may august november and uh, your quarterly issues should appear online on last day or first day of february and other months other listed months you should have pro, uh, good editorial board so if you have good edi editorial board you may satisfy one of the main criterion for indexing by scopus and web of science your editorial board members should know about equator network standards they should be active reviewers themselves so they should have problems profile as well your journal and uh, proceedings of shevchenko scientific society journal also has impressive profile on problems review crediting system so how many journals have the same review of crediting problems platform recheck if you are author and you wish to submit your journal uh, to article to a good journal pay attention whether that journal has impressive profile on problems uh, your editors should be members of editorial associations so dr zimba is a um, director of newly launched uh, Council of Science Editors and uh, Professor uh, Stanis uh, Rostislav Stoika is a president of that association, Council of Science Editors in uh, Eastern European Association. That association is also good for membering. So I encourage all local Eastern European journal editors to join that association and stick to their recommendations. Other journals may also join com, uh, Committee on Publication Ethics, which is the largest editorial association with more than 13,000 members. Smaller journals may have short list of editorial board members. Large or multidisciplinary journals or journals like PLOS One, PLOS Medicine, uh, 
covering uh, a number of subject areas, they should have long list of editorial board members. Uh, we see in predator, predatory journals, they have editor, short editorial board members and wide range of subject categories. It's also one of the uh, predatory publishing uh, points, criteria. Uh, editors themselves should ethically publish their own articles in their own journal, particularly in emerging journals. So if you are a strong author, a strong editor and good author, you may publish in your uh, own journal to attract readers to share your experience, professional experience, editorial experience, and this type of articles are valuable. You may also publish editorials. So Web of Science and uh, Scopus pays attention to a di uh, whether you publish diversity of articles. If you publish only one type of article without commenting, without evaluating published articles, it's uh, good, not so good. You need evaluation system post publication and editorials, uh, uh, constructive evaluation of published items is quite helpful. Encourage in your local journals to publish more editorials more letters analyzing published articles or letters with replies. So communication between authors and readers. You should also have regular editorial meetings. Now it's easy. Uh, twice a year you can arrange editorial board met meetings and organize it in a way to discuss important issues. Uh, matters arising, something important to update your editorial strategies twice a year. Uh, internationalization of peer review and editorial board members. If your journal is international, so you should have representatives from all continents. If it is regional or Ukrainian, so you should have uh, representatives from most cities of your country. If it is Eastern European, so all countries considered uh, in that region should be uh, contributing to your journal as editorial board members, as authors. So it's important for internationalization. Uh, preference is given uh, to internationalized journals, but there are some uh, nuances, uh, specifics. So if uh, your journal covers some niche in science where only a few scientists from few countries are active. So it's also act acceptable. So in that case, quality of articles should be high enough to sa satisfy indexing criteria. So uh, in terms of quality, we understand scope, coverage of uh, subjects and novelty having uh, the same journal, having, let's say, public health. There are hundreds of public health journals. You cannot publish new journals having the same title, public health. You should uh, uh, publish a uh, journal specifically dealing with public health in your uh, field, in your uh, region, region, if that region uh, is important in terms of public health. So you now probably know about uh, specialized, specialist and uh, multidisciplinary journals. So all specialists need to know about these professional bibliographic databases. And let's say a uh, sociologist uh, publishes systematic review if they do not have access to ProQuest and sociology abstracts, their systematic review is not so um, sophisticated, not so enriched with sociology abstracts. The same refers to psychologists, uh, chemists, agriculture specialists, agriculture specialists or veterinary specialists have Agricola and Agris, here are just examples. And for all uh, PhD candidates, 
This slide is important. What is Clarivate Analytics? It's a provider of databases, a platform, Web of Science, and Web of Science is uh, uh, based on several reputable bibliographic databases. Two of these databases, like Science Citation Index Expanded and Social Science in Citation Index, are important for academic promotion and impact factor of journal. So you are uh, primarily encouraged to publish articles uh, in uh, these two data indexed uh, in these two databases. There are multidisciplinary medical databases, Medline and Embase important for um, veterinary specialists, not just medical, but also veterinary, sociologists, psychiatrists also uh, refer to Medline and Embase. And psychologists, psychi psychiatrists need access also to psych info database. And if journal of their interest is indexed by psych info, it means that it's a good journal worth submitting an article to that journal, even if impact factor of that journal is low. Nurses need access to CINAHAL, uh, gynecologists popline and hygienists or epidemiologists to global health. So now about uh, some amendments in Web of Science core collection processing. Uh, from 2015, uh, Web of Science opened a new, launched new uh, database, so-called incubate, incubator of uh, journals, emerging sources citation database. Uh, they um, accept for coverage of uh, emerging or startup journals with not so strict quality of publishing, not so strict, not so high citation rates, but still peer reviewed ethical journals. And these journals are or can be also considered for citation tracking by and inclusion in journal citation reports for impact factor. So please consider based on this slide, difference between emerging sources citation index and top databases. So emerging sources citation index is a basic basis for uh, coverage of your journal. Uh, you need science citation index expanded or social science citation index to get two year impact factor. And without two year impact factor, it's almost impossible to compete with Lancet, with Nature, Science, and other top scientific journals. So Web of Science or Clarivate Analytics, um, uh, they have strict selective approach. They annually analyze uh, more than 2,000 journals and uh, take for indexing only a handful of journals. These numbers vary from year to year uh, because of pandemic, because of some problems, number of accepted Arctic journals will decrease. But still, you or in your re region may also satisfy some basic indexing criteria of Web of Science core collection, 24 indexing criteria, I will discuss in a bit. And you may enter competition with other uh, Anglophone and non-Anglophone journals. But please note that Web of Science pays attention and tracks journals that are interested, that uh, are of prime interest to US-based or American-based specialists. So if you publish English articles, if you publish topics of interest to American uh, scientists, you may increase indexability of your journal. Web of Science application technical, it's easy. Uh, they need, if it is regular journal, and I know that in Eastern Europe, most journals are regularly published. They need, uh, they wait, Web of Science waits for three regular 
uh, issues to evaluate, to uh, finalize evaluation process. So it may last a, a year or even more, depends on uh, your publishing uh, practices to evaluate your journal. So here is access to Web of Science master journal list and it's freely available, that master journal list. Any specialist may go to that master journal list and pay uh, re um, <clears throat> retrieve list of journals, good target journals in their field of science, in their subject category. So it's also considered as a white list. So if a target journal is listed by Web of Science master journal list, it's a good journal, a promising journal. If journal cannot satisfy even emerging sources citation index criteria, 24 indexing criteria, and uh, rejected by Web of Science uh, on numerous times, so that journal is poor journal. Their indexing criteria are stick, uh, strict, uh, easy, you simply submit uh, information about frequency, ISSN and uh, quality, so easy to submit, but the evaluation process is based on 24 selection criteria and this list is too long. So let's say you pay it, you should pay attention to references. This should be mainly from Web of Science for Web of Science application. Uh, you should pay attention whether public uh, plagiarism detection is in place, whether you have any strategy to check for plagiarism by Authenticate, by Grammarly, by all, any other valid software for plagiarism detection, or if you trust your authors, ask them to, dis to add disclaimer in their review narrative review articles, because most of the time review articles from some countries particularly from Eastern Mediterranean countries are plagiarized or redundant, contain a number of ideas copied from other sources or contain passages without proper uh, uh, references, proper acknowledgements. So we discussed uh, plagiarism um, detection previously. Uh, Web of Science, particularly when they uh, take journal for journal impact factor uh, tracking, they pay attention to citation metrics of their editorial board members, authors, and journal editors. So it's highly selective database. Web of Science databases are highly selective and procedure is also strict. Clarity of language. We have in our team of speakers, Tatiana Yakhantova from, from Lviv, Lviv University. And she's one of the top specialists in language. She's an editor herself and she helped us a lot to, uh, to improve your ac academic English writing practices. Your journals need a specialist like Tatiana Yakhantova to satisfy Web of Science indexing. You should correct, you should pay attention to abstracts. Abstract should be in readable English, in understandable English, primarily abstracts, but also uh, texts as well. So clarity of English is essential for Web of Science coverage. And of course, they pay attention to ethic statements from Vani, COP, COP um, and other ethic, ethic statements. Now, about your journals, you see that uh, so far you have only 15 journals with two year impact factor listed by journal citation reports. So it's top level, only 15. But Web of Science covers more than 100 journals uh, from your uh, part of the world. And most of these journals are covered by emerging sources citation index. If they increase the citation rates, they may satisfy 
may enter journal citation reports. Uh, as a specialist, narrow specialist, you go to your field of interest. Here I presented rheumatology. In rheumatology, there are 31 journals. In your field, you may have longer list of journals with two-year impact factor. So it's elite, so-called elite uh, list of journals. Uh, and uh, along with these elite journals, we also have 50 uh, journals covered by Web of Science. And again, most of them are listed, uh, are tracked by Emerging Sources Citation Index. So these journals are visible for searches on Web of Science search platform. It's also good to cover, to uh, get indexed by Emerging Sources Citation Index, but for prestige of your journal, for citation metrics and higher level of competition, you need to get to your impact factor. Uh, I mentioned about Emerging Sources Citation Index. Some journals entered this uh, database, but uh, they still remain in that uh, citation, in that um, abstract tracking hub, Emerging Sources Citation Index, without any changes over the past five years. But good journals move from Emerging Sources Citation Index to uh, Science Citation Index Expanded or Social Science Citation Index. And these databases help to get to your impact factor. We should know about differences between Web of Science, Scopus and Google Scholar. Uh, there are differences. Google Scholar, it is just search engine. And we uh, do not uh, recommend Google Scholar for systematic searches. It's for basic searches, for clinicians, for students, but not database, not bibliographic database, search engine, but not database. Medline for medical specialists and for uh, agrarians, agriculture specialists, veterinary specialists. Uh, Medline covers more than 5,500 journals. They have their own priorities. Main priority is evidence-based. So you should publish evidence-based articles to meet Medline uh, indexing criteria and enter uh, PubMed, uh, visible in PubMed. Their Medline selection criteria, again, tough, not based on citation metrics, based primarily on quality of articles. And you see this long list of quality items for journal editors. Example of blinded journal evaluation. Uh, one of the journals submitted to Medline and they got 3.3 uh, for their journal. They need to get 3.7 based on total score to meet Medline indexing criteria. So they evaluated quality of case reports. Uh, they evaluated uh, ethics statements of that journal. And they also po uh, paid attention whether the journal uh, scope is rela relevant to biomedicine, relate to um, whether the journal covers regional issues of regional importance or it's local, local locally important journals are not covered by Medline, so et cetera, et cetera. So they have in place evaluation policy to evaluate different types of articles, review articles, original research papers, case reports, illustrations. So pay attention whether the illust illustrations are of high quality, whether you publish review articles with graphics, figures, tables, so all these uh, parts are important. If a journal, particularly in Eastern Mediterranean, they, if they publish review articles with full text, without images, without graphs, so they uh, distract readers, busy readers, and they damage uh, indexing prosperity of their journal. There is difference between Medline, search platform, 
and uh, a Medline indexing database and PubMed. Medline and PubMed Central. PubMed Central is a digital repository or digital library uh, related to uh, PubMed. Uh, PubMed. PubMed may also index some of non-medical journals, particularly from uh, library, sociology, information science, and other fields. Uh, Scientometrics, here is, here is example from Scientometrics. They may uh, archive uh, some uh, articles if these articles are sponsored by uh, UA, National Institutes of High uh, Health Specialists with funded by National Health National Institutes of Health of uh, US. So about Embase, if your journal fails uh, to get indexed by Scopus and still covers pharmacy, pharmacology, you still may satisfy except the Medica or Embase online bibliographic database. It's for pharmacy, pharmacology, toxicology. Uh, their difference uh, with Medline is that they cover more non-anglophone sources because Embase, like Scopus, are European databases and they are interested more in Eastern European, European articles and your journals from Eastern Europe may also satisfy their indexing criteria. It's easy to submit your journal application if you failed, if your journal application to Scopus is failed. But if your journal application is accepted by Scopus, you often automatically are offered Embase uh, coverage as well. Their selection criteria are not so tough compared to Scopus. They pay attention to editorial boards and peer review process, articles in English quality, and publication by experienced publisher. So experienced publisher is viewed as large publisher, maybe large publisher, Elsevier, Springer, Nature, uh, Wiley, etc. But it can be also professional association publishing good journal with large membership. So it's also uh, important to have good publisher with large number of members. Cochrane Library has its own databases and uh, I hope that pharmacy pharmacology specialists will go uh, try to index the journal with uh, Cochrane Library. Global Health is a service of uh, Commonwealth uh, Agricultural Bureau International, CUB International. For veterinary specialists, it's, it's important database. So if you are going to write systematic review, go to go Global Health and retrieve articles from Global Health as well for your systematic reviews, dissertations, etc. Safety lead, lead for orthopedic specialists, they need it. First, they need to index their journal and use it for systematic searches as well. You know about Scopus, they cover 100% of in the, uh, Medline index journals. It's a database of uh, journals for, from Europe mainly, from, uh, America, uh, from Anglophone and non-Anglophone journals or countries. So it's more liberal in terms of language and they cover a larger number of journals, 25,000, more than 25,000 peer reviewed journals. They pay attention, they go deeper in and deeper. They cover back issues as well of journals. And uh, you may also contact uh, Scopus as well. They track digital identifiers of authors, um, articles, universities, uni affiliation, uh, Scopus affiliation ID is something new. They also cover that. And you can also search individual profile of authors on Scopus platform, affiliation ranking, go to these affiliations and analyze these affiliations. Pay attention to highly cited articles. And I uh, mentioned about classics uh, of some articles in certain fields. So Scopus is helpful in terms of citations. 
their application pr uh, procedure is quite helpful, uh, easy. You may also consult this, uh, go through these steps as well, but please pay attention to quality of your journal and then apply. Without quality, your application will be re uh, declined. Uh, at, because of some reasons. They uh, may analyze nine se selected articles submitted by you or three most recent journal issues. It's up to you to submit. So if your recent articles, your recent journal issues are of high quality and within uh, you published at least your journal within past two years, high quality journal, so it can be submitted. Scopus journal selection criteria overlap with mostly with um, Web of Science, but there is with some uh, difference. Web of Science pays attention whether you publish articles by influential authors, authors with high citation rates, high Hirsch indexes. If you do not have authors, reviewers, and uh, editorial board members with high citation rates, uh, your chances of indexing by Web of Science lower. So we also have some uh, Simago journal and country rank is based on Scopus. I mentioned several times about this free platform we also may uh, generate information about our journals via journal talks. Your table of content, uh, con uh, contents are uh, distributed. And in Eastern Europe, now hundreds of journals covered by this distribution service. They simply need automatic connection to your journal website. And if you have uh, a really simple syndication, which tracks table of contents of your issues, you may uh, join this initiative, uh, Scottish initiative of uh, distribution of information about your journal. Ulrich periodical, recheck before submission of your journal, whether your journal ISSN is updated and listed by Ulrich periodicals. If not, again, Scopus may decline your application based on technical criteria. So recheck in Ulrich, Ulrich periodicals directory before, before submission. I know that Open Science in, in Ukraine carefully rechecks that status of uh, your ISSN index and sends information to Ulrich uh, via uh, ISSN center. So it's good to have provider of services like uh, uh, Open Science in Ukraine or other regional service providers. So uh, you may also get, you also need to get uh, digital object ident identifier. So without digital object identifier, it's again, almost impossible. So pay attention whether target journal that you, your article is published has digital object identifier for your article. If not, so it's poor journal, careless journal. If they have digital object identifiers, it's okay, it's good. So uh, a number of information aggregators are important, EBSCO. Uh, so now there is also psych info for our specialists uh, attending today, psychologists, psychiatrists, and uh, neurologists, they should know that PsychInfo is highly prestigious database, specialist database, uh, and indexing criteria are similar to Medline indexing criteria. For education specialists, pay attention to uh, ERIC or um, other education indexing databases. Uh, example is American Journal of Education is covered by ERIC. Chemical or biochemistry specialists apply to chemical abstract service. They have uh, their main criterion for coverage is relevance. And of course, they will pay attention to abstracts, quality of abstracts. Physics specialists have uh, 
in spec, which is covered by uh, Elsevier platform as well. Agricola is for agriculture, veterinary specialists. They have their own uh, search uh, platform. Compendex is for geology specialists. And I know that some Eastern European journals, geology journals are covered. Library information scientists, their journals may be covered by LISTA, uh, presented on EBSCO information aggregator. Uh, linguists may try to, let's say, I know that you have Inozemna, Inozemni MOVA journal from Lviv University. So that journal may satisfy Modern Languages Association International Bibliography. Geology specialists have another spe uh, economy specialist uh, uh, may need uh, understanding and awareness of a REPEC uh, hub. It's not just bibliographic database, it's hub repository as well. Uh, and uh, one of the top journal, American Journal Economic Association, and their journal, American Journal of, uh, of Economy, covered by them, by that database and hub of information. Mathematics specialists have their own, Math uh, C SciNet or uh, Central Blood Blood Math database or so specialist database for mathematicians and all specialists need coverage by Duarte. Libraries for some of those who are going to uh, publish print issues. So these are also important. So you probably have your own local regional library try to refer to that library as well. Over to you. Uh, Dia Arman. Thank you very much. You generously sh shared with us your rich uh, editors and authors experience. Thank you very much. And we have two questions from our participants. Uh, the first one is uh, from Oksana Zajkivska. Um, Arman, you was mentioned about importance of editorial. Now I am working on you once for our journal. Uh, can I present uh, in each several papers published in that issue? Good question. Yes, your journal is uh, not covered by uh, journal citation re reports. So there is no need to think about auto citations. You can cite articles in your own journal and in your uh, editorial, but of course, there should be a logical balance. You refer to some of uh, journals in your uh, articles in your journal and uh, evaluate these articles. So there should be logical balance. There is also one important thing. If you publish editorial and in that editorial with 200 references, 80, 90% of references are to your own journal articles, so-called journal auto citations. You violate principles of uh, unbiased citations and your uh, journal, if it is covered by journal citation reports, will lose its impact factor. So try to keep uh, balance. Uh, thank you. And the next question uh, from uh, Dmitry Lega. Uh, from? Is it uh, uh, Dmitry Lega? Is it still possible for a journal uh, to become a part of Scopus or Web of Science without publishing uh, articles exclusively in English, but in Ukrainian also? The, the journal covers mostly uh, chemistry uh, issues. Okay. So. Uh, Dmitry Lega is probably a chemist or chemistry specialist. Uh, yes, your journal may satisfy Scopus and Web of Science indexing criteria if you publish in uh, languages other than English. Of course, in your part of world, you should try to publish at least some percentage of articles in English to attract readers from other countries let's say from neighboring countries. Uh, 
Um, but even non-anglophone journals should publish some of uh, information in English. Let's say you have figures, tables in your uh, language, in your local language, but titles of these figures should be in both languages, English and Ukrainian. The same refers, refers to all other sections of uh, journal articles. So this type of um, bilingual journals, the journal publishing is also acceptable because you help to draw attention of Anglophone readers to figures, to tables, and understand at least titles of these graphical, uh, materi graphical material. So this is also acceptable. And also it depends on field of science. If in your field of science, most journals are published in English, you publish in your local language, you lose competition with the rest of journals already listed by Scopus and Web of Science. So pay attention to journals already covered by Scopus and the Web of Science, and then decide to continue publishing in your local language or switching to English. Thank you. And uh, the other question from uh, Vasil Goncino. Uh, keywords, Chicago. yes, from Chicago. Uh, keywords are often requested by publisher. Uh, should the author use specific lists uh, of keywords uh, or make them uh, up? as the authors feels the best to reflect the material. Okay, perfect. So there are, in medicine, we have uh, most subject categories represented by medical subject heading. We can take, find, we can find these structured keywords and we should uh, put uh, uh, a below abstract. These C, C, four to six keywords. But the same refers, refers to pharmacology, pharmacy, because they have uh, keywords from except the medical. Linguists have their own arts and humanities specialists. I'm not going to discuss these keywords. Almost all specialists have their own keywords. But if you do not have keywords or unaware of keywords or thesaur, uh, <clears throat> vocabularies in your field, you can put log logical keywords based on common words used in your text. Then journal editor, professional journal editor may change these keywords, replace your or author keywords by more uh, widely used uh, structured keywords. To avoid conflict with author, journal editor simply ask to improve um, quality of keywords. If author refuses, then these keywords are, uh, um, they do not touch these keywords. Simply after indexing, you will see difference between your author keywords and keywords indexed, uh, indexed keywords selected by Scopus experts, Medline experts, Web of Science experts. Thank you, Dr. Arman. Uh, it uh, looks uh, like we have covered all items of today's uh, webinar. It was really long marathon, more than uh, three hours. Yeah, not sprint. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's more like, like marathon. Yeah. Long marathon, long way. Yes, long but, way. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to express my gratitude to all uh, participants of uh, today's webinar, particularly those from Lviv, uh, those from Vinitsa, Ternopil, Kharkiv, uh, Va um, Sofia, uh, Bulgaria, Qatar, Bulgaria. Qatar, yeah, Who US, else? <laughs> US, Chicago, any other city? Ternopil, uh, we mentioned Ternopil, yeah? Of, of course, Thank Ternopil, you. Ternopil, yeah. yes. Thank you to all these cities. I hope that uh, our webinar series will be useful 
to your universities and your university research management teams will in, improve somehow change uh, their um, guidelines their uh, journal instructions primarily journal instructions you should invest more in your university journals you should publish more english journals to compete with other uh, universities and once you enter your journal enters scopus you increase reputation of your university enormously increase the rank of your university and your country as well so compete and try to increase number of journals in scopus 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 and scopus and of course if your journal is covered by emerging sources citation index web of science improve citation level by increasing number of uh, English articles, attractive cita citable articles, and move to science citation index expanded. Other questions, comments? Uh, comments from Dmitry Lega, waiting uh, for the next webinar. <laughs> from uh, Serhii uh, Kirilyuk, thank you very much. It's very important for me. Thanks to Dr. Arman and the organizers. All fellows, participants of this webinar series, series will be supported by me as authors if uh, within acceptable and ethical frames. Of course, I'll continue my support to Vinnitsa fellows, to journal editors in Kiev, my support to Professor Marta Jus, to Professor Oksana Zajic-Kivska, and my involvement in their journals, in their academic activities, my support of Serhii Kiriluk, support to Vladimir Boyajiva, Boyajiva from Bulgaria. Uh, who else? Remind me others who... Bogdana Daskaluk. Bogdana Daskaluk also was with us. Yes. <laughs> you forget about... <laughs> thank, thank you very much to Dana, who is, uh, who is rising star in Eastern Europe, and I'm sure she will be next research manager in her university and editor of journal in her university, manager of Council of Science, Council of Science editors. She's also one of managers. Thank you, Bogdana uh, Duskaluk. Uh, Irina Shapoval, thank you very much. And convey my uh, gratitude to Vinitsa National Medical University. You are very active and I am sure your university deserves more and more because of active participation and uh, continuing medical education of fellows like Irina Shapoval. We should name all these fellows. <sighs> Yelena Bondarenko, veterinary specialist from Kharkiv. I am sure her knowledge will be very helpful after all these seminars, uh, uh, webinars, sorry, webinars, she is now precious asset for her own university. And also we may refer to her editorial credentials, reviewer support in our multidisciplinary journals. You know that we support, consult many other journals, not just medical, but also allied, special allied journals. So, and yes, Ternopil also quite active over the past uh, year. Today we have many uh, participants from Ternopil. Ternopil, medics, yeah? Uh, mostly medics, yes. Medics, pediatricians, uh, I guess, because Professor Svetlana Smijan uh, has been quite active. Yeah, so message is just not to promote this webinar, series, but also to encourage all participants to enforce these points uh, in their own journals uh, uh, when they write their articles and target good journals. Stop targeting only two or three journals that violate research and publication ethics norms. Thank you to everyone, to today's participants. If you have any comments, quick comments. I'll be uh, happy to hear your comments. Dr. Arman, thank you very much for your support, for your regular contribution. Thank you very much. Are there uh, any uh, questions uh, or comments from our participants before we finish? Uh, who would like to add something? 
Briefly, yes. <laughs> well, just briefly. Um, uh, yeah. I, yeah. Um, when you when you mention about uh, data searches. Uh, can I ask you to start a uh, video? Switch on video, please. Yes, uh, yes. Oh, okay. perfect. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so, we see you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when, when you, in your last uh, segment, you talked about um, uh, databases and, you know, how to do the search, PubMed, and et cetera. And, and you mentioned Google Scholar, not to use that as a uh, database search. It's perfectly, absolutely right. But I would like to just underscore for especially our Eastern European colleagues who might have limited access to libraries and to electronic uh, publications. I mean, if you don't subscribe to a, uh, to a uh, publication, you might not have access, or if you don't have that through your library, and maybe not all libraries have this access. Certainly in the West, we have access through libraries. But I find, uh, and I'm very impressed with how much, uh, how many articles I can download from Google Scholar. So I would certainly use that perhaps not as a research tool to do a thorough search of literature, but as an auxiliary tool in which to actually download the material. Because uh, uh, I think a lot of our colleagues rely on, on open sources, uh, which of course has a lot of predatory journals and the like. But uh, if, you, if you have knowledge through PubMed of specific good, um, uh, articles that you'd like to find, you can find them. And uh, sometimes you, you miss, you, do, you can't get to it because it's, it's locked in by the publisher, but there are those that have placed it uh, on the web. For instance, uh, as you mentioned, the NIH, if, if there's any NIH money involved, then that article will be available, uh, number one. Number two, there are researchers who will put their own publication out, so via their own library, Kansas or somewhere else, they will put it out on the web and you can, uh, you can find it. You might not get it through the publisher, but you can get it through a researcher who placed it, the PDF on, on, uh, on the internet. So I just say that as a, as a, research, as a tool uh, that, that researchers and, and physicians and clinicians can use to, uh, to access various publications. You're right. Uh, just uh... Your comments are always music to my ears. Yeah, I like your <laughs> comments. Uh, very useful. And I hope that uh, all today's participants and viewers of uh, these webinars will follow your advice. Continue searching through Google Scholar to retrieve hundreds of articles in their field of interest. But the problem with uh, Google Scholar is not just because it contains information from predatory journals or substandard journals. Uh, searches through Google Scholar in US or in Ukraine differ. So we need reproducibility of our search strategies globally. So if we have differences, we cannot rely on that type of um, search engine. Scopus, Web of Science have the same uh, search strategy and the same search options and retrieval uh, results in any part of the world. This is why for systematic reviews, we need reliable databases for searches. Uh, Scopus, Web of Science, uh, Cochrane Library for reproducibility to uh, ensure reproducibility of searches. And also uh, your uh, point about um, uh, Google Scholar. Why uh, Google Scholar and Dimensions, you probably also know that the Dimensions also almost the same as Google Scholar. They cover hundreds, millions of sources. Uh, and again, they use, uh, Google Scholar uses page rank algorithm. Uh, Google Scholar uh, uses that algorithm and uh, weighs more article that are more downloaded, more used, so uh, linked to high traffic. Whereas in Scopus and Web of Science, there is no such thing, thing as traffic or promotion activities. Uh, the main criterion for searches and retrieval is uh, quality, keywords. 
So there are some differences. Uh, librarians, information scientists know about these differences and they should help uh, those who are going to write systematic reviews. Thank yes. you very much, Professor. If, if I can just also underscore, it came to mind, <clears throat> uh, there is a difference between Google and Google Scholar. Uh, because one may go just on Google and think I, I can get, uh, uh, you know, a, a particular article with a particular title. That, that won't work. Google works mostly with ideas and keywords and the like, and it will bring up various things, whether they're books or items or whatever. I mean, a, a potpourri of things. Whereas Google Scholar works on the principle of a title, a uh, title of a book or even an author. Uh, and so once you have a specific title, go to Google Scholar and it gives you not only that, but it gives you similar ones because it'll take keywords out of that title and give you uh, similar uh, articles, uh, you know, that, that have those keywords within the title. But um, so there's a difference, Google and Google Scholar. And there's also Google Books. I mean, if you, there are some books, uh, certainly not current ones, but there are some books that, that are, uh, that have been downloaded in libraries and you would have to go through Google Books to, to find those. And there is also Google Citations, a Google Scholar Citations. So all scholars with uh, articles visible on Google and Google Scholar may register with Google Scholar Citations. It's linked with Gmail, with other Google services and track their own articles in terms of citations, cit citability. So it's good for Google, but uh, when we compare Google Scholar with Dimensions, we see that Dimensions covers also alternative metrics more. So uh, Digital Science Initiative and um, uh, dimension, Dimensions is more advanced search engine, search option. So it's up to scholars. Of course, your point, your comment also in, should be of interest to clinicians, busy clinicians, who work with just Google. They need uh, quick searches. They use two keywords, let's say uh, thrombosis and COVID-19, and they can uh, search Google. Uh, they can also improve their treatment and diagnostics. We also now, now use that term, Google therapy, Google diagnostics, by using two or three keywords for quick searches, quick answers to diagnostic or treatment questions. So thank you very much for uh, mm, emphasizing importance of uh, Google and Google Scholar. It's important because today we also have not just um, uh, authors, we also have clinicians, busy clinicians who need some tips, some reminders how to benefit from Google and Google Scholar searches. Thank you very much. And, and I want to thank you again. Also, uh, another uh, thing that uh, I heard today, which I will put into effect immediately, is your idea that authors should put down their ORCID and their Twitter handle. Uh, you know, I never thought about that. But, you know, I'm, I'm editing a book right now, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to have e each one of them uh, give me that, that information. I think that's so, so current. So can you... Ah, if you deal with American US best editors, it, uh, authors, it's easy. They yeah. use Twitter, they can uh, provide you with Twitter handle and that Twitter handle should be uh, visible, open access. So are you going to open access to your book that you are editing? Twitter handles and all Twitter uh, options are primarily for open access books. But uh, try. Well, okay. I yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not open access. Obviously, you know, it's a Springer book and they, you know, oh, they want $38, 38 pounds per even, article. Okay, good. Because even if there is no open access, no PubMed Central archiving, still all Springer uh, uh, books are available through Springer link, their online yeah. library. Yeah, it's okay. So yeah. it's a large library, uh, editor, uh, large publisher. So it's good. So ORCID ID and Twitter handle can increase visibility of your book chapters. Right. But in my opinion, Twitter and uh, Twitter handle and uh, ORCID IDs help to increase 
visibility of open access articles further. Sure, sure. Yeah. It, it was primarily a message to Professor Oksana Zaechkivska. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Oksana Stanislavina, would you like to add something? Uh, yes. Did you see me? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, first of all, Armand, for a um, very elegant and in presentation, very interesting topics. It's really uh, was excited. Mm -hmm. And you did a, group, uh, did a great job, especially today when you deliver all three lectures. Um, Not just me, Professor Lanchina as well. Yes. As yes, he's he's uh, also our speaker. And yeah. <laughs> And uh, next, my uh, congratulations to uh, going to the um, Olena, Dr. Zimba, who served for us uh, last seven months. Uh, very hard <laughs> job, yes, to connect us and to provide this uh, platform for communication. So thank you very much, Olena. Without you, we cannot... Uh, uh, do and did so much and so great uh, job. Thank you. Uh, next point is a very interesting topic because um, uh, when uh, we start to think about the indexing our journal two years ago, uh, you know, uh, we didn't know a lot of things. Now we understand and each seminar bring to us new knowledge and something new. Uh, for congratulations me, on e listing your journal by Duach. Yes, thank you very much. And step by step, we are um, moving to the civilization, to the <laughs> uh, st high standards of scientific writing. And what I thought um, before and uh, would like to discuss uh, today is very important to create uh, some... Uh, possibilities for our young uh, people to study scientific writing uh, as um, additional course. Yes, it's very important because unfortunately in um, Ukrainian um, universities, medical or classical universities or any uh, universities, you never find this uh, course of scientific writing. Mm -hmm. And it's also bad mistake that this is scientific writing is very important for PhD students, of course, but for physicians is obligatory because physicians, mm -hmm. It's like investigator uh, and uh, all physicians should uh, learn uh, all professional life and present cases, yes, communication, to participate in the different conferences, local conferences, in department, next step in the hospital, next mm -hmm. step abroad, yes, in the um, country. And uh, we have very nice, uh, smart uh, generation of young physician who are fluent in uh, foreign, foreign languages. And they um, interesting is this course. And they told to me, oh, uh, we have in our university, you know, Arman, very well working uh, student scientific organization and students who are excellent and who uh, have experience uh, to present uh, some uh, um, small pieces of research in uh, this uh, conferences. Of course, they are one had taller for opposite but this it should be uh, some like scientific part and some courses mm -hmm. and um, I think we should think about this to because totally it agree help, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, grow up new generation of uh, more smarter more educated uh, physicians first of all uh, thank you very much. Uh, excellent point. So we should uh, arrange it as an international course uh, for PhD fellows based on your comment. And we may also arrange it uh, um, as part of consortium initiative. Uh, let's say a few universities support this course. Oh, it can be initially in uh, online and then uh, in face-to-face uh, -face course. Let's say we have um, Chicago University, uh, Tirnopol University, 
Kharkiv University and all these universities uh, um, join efforts and arrange this course, online course for PhD fellows in your part of the world. It can be done and uh, I'm sure that uh, research managers in or vice chancellors for research in these universities will accept this initiative, support it somehow. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, by platform, by uh, uh, inviting uh, participants, and it will be great. Yeah, thank you for excellent point. We also need uh, lecturers like you, like Professor Lanchina, like Professor uh, Yachantova Tatiana, because language, Tatiana Yachantova is language specialist, and Latika Gupta, Durga Misra, all our regular speakers will help, will invest their time and um, experience in educating PhD fellows, your journal editors, and we also consult before the uh, journal application to Scopus, to Web of Science, hopefully also to Medline. Yes, so, we are thinking excellent. about this and we would like uh, to move forward. Uh, so now we are working on this second issue and maybe now we will have two years, nice. Uh... Yeah, you're, I am well aware of your journal. It's a regional journal and uh, uh, published by a prestigious publisher and uh, I'm sure that uh, it will be indexed sooner or, or la later. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We do, hope. we do hope. We do hope. Will happen. Okay, thank you for everyone and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Yes, thank you very much. Pana dla do pana Vasilia vже ukrainskoyu. Pane Vasilio, dużo proszę skontaktujcie z tym autorem naszym nowym panem Jurijem Kuzyczem, że nadislav statiu post graduate education yeah. in uh, Ukraine. Він не розуміє, що таке Орсід. Я йому вже декілька листів написала за Орсід, і він каже, що в Америці то не потрібно. І ви розумієте, і то є так... Орсід is important, yeah, for all. Тепер не відповідає, просто disappear on my horizon. Я йому кажу, що то є дві хвилини працювати, розумієте? Дві хвилини, і він буде мати... Може, я погано йому пишу, може, ви можете можете... Я поговорю з ним. Питання є. So, stay healthy, everyone, and hope to see you again next time. Yes. We'll see. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.